Alrighty then, I believe that's our cue to get this thing started. What do you reckon, Hello. Yeah. Hello, we're here, we're at the bar and we're partially drunk already, so that's always a good start. We just open the doors, walk in like, yeah, time to talk about <laughs> movies. Oh, get to a bar at some point and just bark at the bartender, beer! Just make it happen. <laughs> Either way, no, we are here, and it's open bar number 48, so we're edging ever closer to that magical 50, so that'll be nice when we yeah. get to that. It's gonna, we're going to have to do something momentous for the occasion, I think. We'll just right. uh, we'll keep drinking we'll for 24 hours. The ideas, okay. What's that? <laughs> you creatively brained you. You're going to have to come up with some idea. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do Maybe something. Take it'll a shot for every time someone has a controversial opinion. Ooh, we can't do that. We'll be dead by no, the end we of dead. it. No, we're dead. Yeah, that's the opening. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but anyway, well, uh, we should start bringing in our guests because we've we've got a bunch of people here that's been good enough to join us, and we've got a lot to talk about. So, uh, well, first guest, Lara, the critical doggo, <laughs> making her long-awaited return. <laughs> it was it was smoky last week, and uh, people wanted more dog cams, so there she is. Um, you can tell she's excited to be on the open bar. So, what can I say? You know, yeah, you know, um, some guests uh, they speak a little less than others, and that is absolutely okay. Just uh... yeah. She, she give your opinions when you want it. Doesn't chime in often, but when she does, well, you know, you, you get something pretty insightful from her. So yeah. it's it's uh, it's definitely worth definitely worth having her around. So we'll keep that going. Um, but yes, in the in the vein of like actual humans that we can talk to as well, we have also got uh, making his his journey from the land of Ifa over to here. It's Fringy. Hey, man. Hello. How's everybody doing? <laughs> yeah, wonderfully. Very good. You might know Mauler. I don't know. You've probably heard of him. <laughs> we met. I think the, don't know if the two of you have ever streamed together, but here he is. I don't know if I've ever streamed with Lara, uh, but I appreciate it. This mm -hmm. yeah. uh, smile on my face, just seeing her snoozing there. <laughs> well, you, you can tell she's excited to talk to you as well, so that's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we have also got uh, Baggage Claim, who's returning after a month or two. Uh, great to see you again. Thank you for coming back for this. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? Hello. We are doing well. There. Yes. All right. And uh, last all, last of up, sorry, uh, we have got Little Platoon, who's becoming almost like a regular on this, this bar. And, you, <laughs> you know. Drinks almost as much as I do, so that's all good. <laughs> good leave when they close. He's just sitting yeah. in the bar. I'm all right. I stay for the lock-in. Lock-ins are always the best part of any evening in the pub. Mm. I tend to just get locked out of pubs, unfortunately, rather than <laughs> locked in. It's just, yeah, yeah it's... it's uh, they have enough of me after a certain point. But hey, it's good to have you back, man, so thank you for coming back for this. Thank you for having me. We've, uh, we've got a bunch of things we were going to cover tonight, um, particularly Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Not everyone in the panel has seen it, however, so I think it makes more sense to talk about um, some of the other things in our lineup. Uh, principally, Peter Pan and Wendy, or Wendy and Peter Pan, as the case may be. Uh, it came out, I believe, this week and got absolutely savaged <laughs> once it came out. I'm just... Uh, no way. If you bear with me one <laughs> second, I'm going to check the, uh, the Rotten Tomatoes score um, and see what it's sitting at. Because it wasn't looking too good last time I checked. But, uh, all right, Peter and Wendy. It's yeah, it's pretty small. The <laughs> so, amongst the critics, uh, who we all deeply respect, it's sitting at 65%. The audience score, with more than 2,500 ratings, is 15%. Oh, oh, yeah. That is a brutal score. Um, but for the people that have seen it, and I know a few people on the panel here have, uh, I think it's probably quite well deserved. I would say <laughs> it wasn't a great movie, was it? It wasn't. I'm slightly oh, conflicted on that one, though. Um, I don't think it was as bad as 15 percent or whatever that score is. I think it was awful, but I can think of a lot of things that I would give 15 percent more than this. The problem with this wasn't that it was 
sort of like comically bad in the way that so much modern Marvel stuff is. The problem with this is that you've taken Peter Pan, which is this sort of timeless, magical story, and you've produced this grey, soulless, unimaginative, slightly yeah. self-contradicting thing, which the writers clearly didn't understand themselves. And you've somehow turned Peter Pan into a villain without even realising it, which is quite well done. I think, yes. uh, yeah, I was going to talk about that, actually. But, yeah, I think whenever it's a beloved property that you've basically uh, bastardized and ruined, uh, there's always going to be that extra level of venom amongst the audience um, and a, a, a desire to vote it down. And I think it ticks that box. You know, you've taken a, a children's classic story that's been around for, what, well over 100 years now. Yeah, uh, 120 years. Yeah, and you've produced a, a modern version of it um, with all the, the garbage that comes along with that. And it, it just brings about that extra layer of anger amongst uh, fans, I suppose, and audiences. And it's probably that which is driving this. But uh, yeah, when you're talking about the, the the sort of villainous nature of Peter Pan, like, yeah, there's there's quite a lot to talk about in this. I'm going to say Wendy as well is kind of horrible as a character. Um, the very yeah, first time you see her. It was quite appropriate. Her, That's what I was going yeah. to say. The first line is she being a completely just so insolent with her mom. And it's like the first thing she's like giving her attitude. Like, yeah, mom, I heard you the first time. It, it's an interesting context. Like the first time you meet her, she's... Uh... Oh, no her age so she beats their asses and then hits one of them like hits their sword so hard that it flies out of his hand and smashes a mirror because she's just determined to win and then when their parents come in instead of being like the the slightly like self-sacrificial heroic character that you might think where she would say it was all my fault i'm really sorry she's just straight up like yeah it was his fault blame him <laughs> like completely throws her brothers under the bus and uh Afterwards, when one of them tries to call her out on it and say, like, why, why did you blame us for that? She's just like, well, you wanted to play as pirates, didn't you? It's every man for himself. And I just thought, great, that's a hero I can root for. <laughs> and, then it's, and then that character trait is never referenced again. So I didn't even understand why they needed to put that in there. Because it's not like she behaves like that ever again or learns from it or grows from it. It's just never mentioned again. Well, that, that was the problem with it, because I went back, I, I'm doing the v video on this at the moment, well, fighting copyright, the video's been done for like two days, but still not up. Oh. Um, but I, I just put it on just out of morbid curiosity, and then I found myself thinking, how the hell have they ruined it like this? So I went back and I, I watched the 53 version, I watched the 2003 version, and I read, mm. I think, half of Barry's novelization as well, just to sort of understand the difference in character set up and and that's one of the many important ones that they've missed out so like the 53 animated film does this really well um the realization that she has in sort of the second third of the film is that she is already a little bit too old for all of this and she's already been shown in her first scene being kind of motherly to her brothers and so the payoff isn't this sort of pivot moment where she thinks neverland is great oh no it's horrible i want to go home it's no neverland is great but i am also ready to be a bit more than this and so the payoff at the end of it is this weird little but quite charming marriage when her, like her dad goes to the window and says you know i think i've seen that that pirate ship before and it's this middle ground between the desire to grow up um, but also the memory of childhood, and you shouldn't be doing too much of one too quickly. But this film just junks all of that. There's no actual setup. Like you say, she begins as this all-action, bombastic, sword-wielding, normal, boring superhero girl. And that's kind of how she is throughout until she decides just for some reason she's changed her mind and she wants to go home instead. Which is not quite so fulfilling a, a story as the original, I don't think. I think what they're trying to do as well is it's weird... Uh, how they frame this in the story, but they obviously want to get that feminist message in there that she, um, you know, she wants to <laughs> build adventure and, and and action and stuff like that. But her her setup at the beginning of the story is that she's going to go off to college, isn't she? She's she's going to go off to get an education and stuff, and she she's not quite ready for it. Or she doesn't want to do that because she wants to rebel against her parents. But simultaneously, they they want to have her as this like feminist icon who wants to like break free of like the uh, constraints of Victorian expectations of girls. Um, and I just thought to myself, that's exactly what they're trying to give her. They're trying to send her to school to get her an education where she could <laughs> then get a job and and have like some kind of you know fulfilling career, like be able to do more for herself. So it's almost like she sacrifices her own uh, goals in pursuit of like trying to be this this rebellious feminist, but it's like they're trying to fucking help you, you idiot! <laughs> like it's so <laughs> weird. 
I feel like in your little summary that you forget to mention what revolutionary technology she invented. I've been getting used to that at this point. So, yeah, Did yeah. You skip that uh, part I'm, on this one. The, well, she. It's. I'm skipping ahead here, but you get to see like a little glimpse of her future life because it's like, in order to fly in Neverland, you have to think happy thoughts. That's what like allows you to, you know, um, to to fly and 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 uh, break free of all your constraints. So her happy thoughts are her future life, and it's all being a single career woman <laughs> it's i kid you not it's like uh, graduating from school uh becoming a writer and then fucking dying alone in her house as an old lady which she becomes oh. an airplane pilot at one point oh yeah as well, flying, which, a, flying, flying an airplane, airplane which is famously victorian women did that all the time so it's a real aspiration <laughs> for her it is it is bizarre it, i you know we've we've said this before like where you often see just the the hang-ups and the angst of the this thing just intruding into the story i mean she hulk was just basically uh you know a, a sort of 30 something singleton millennial woman um idea of like female empowerment and that this is just yeah. a similar idea where it's very much a 21st century view uh of what you should do with your life and none of it revolves around uh, being a parent, having a family, mm -hmm. like raising the next generation, like dying fulfilled because you know you've brought like all these other people into the world, um, which is funny because it's one of the pivotal aspects of Wendy as a character, her maternal mm -hmm. nature. Uh, in the books, <laughs> here it's completely absent. So. There's a good little scene comparison yeah. you can do that you can play. That there's the moment in the Fifty Three film where um, she tells the brothers that they're going home tomorrow, and they say no, we, we want to stay. And she says no, but you need to go home. You need a mother. And then she explains to them what a mother is, and she says, you know, mother is is this beautiful, wonderful person. She sings you to sleep. She tells you bedtime stories. She you know she wipes the dead off your knees and all the rest of that. She's a brilliant person. Two thousand and twenty three mm. has the same scene, and her line is, "I'm not your mother. I don't even know if I want to be a mother." And on we go. Yeah. So it's like yeah. you you have missed a fundamental part of what made Wendy a character and more important than the boys. The, the thing I think the writers missed in attempting to center Wendy as this sort of feminist icon is that the original was always about the girls. The girls come to the fore in the original mm -hmm. all the time. They're more intelligent than the boys. They're more mature at the same age than the boys. They drive the story along. They're the people we see through. They're the people we grow through. And they're the people that we embody as opposed to idolize. And she idolizes Peter. But Peter's no more really than just this representation of an unreachable ideal, this ideal for mm. eternal youth. And she hmm. sees through that. She sees that. She thinks it's incredibly charming to begin with. There's an unrequited romance, which this film just completely ditches for the sake of nothing, mm. amongst three different characters, which is very pivotal to the original plot and not at all in this one. Um, so you have the girl's perspective all the way through, and the girl is the one who grows, and then she's the one who's held up to be the moral icon of the story. And this one, in a bit to just make her this sword fighting heroine has just reduced that entirely it's kind of depressing i, I think part, I said partly as well it would have come across as super creepy if they tried to have like a romance between her and peter because i swear there must be like a five or six year age gap between them he yeah. looks like a small boy whereas she's like she must be like a good several inches taller than him you know yeah, like she, she looks like so much over older him. than he is and it's just like yeah. that would that would look really weird <laughs> if they tried to get it on. Yeah, but but then the, there are tactful ways they can do that. And the, and again, they did do that in, in Barry's version and the fifty three film, and I think the two thousand and three film as well. Um, there's the bit where she she's obviously clearly quite attracted to him, and she wants to give him a kiss, but she feels like she can't mm. for various different reasons. And so she gives him a thimble instead as this representation of something. You know, she kind of wants to do it, but she knows that it would be irresponsible to do that. So you have quite a, a touching sort of young romance story, but, you know, before it becomes anything more lurid than that. Um, and it, it plays out really nicely. And there's a bit of a payoff later on when Peter gives her another little token back. He still doesn't really understand what it means, but he does vaguely associate it with, mm. with this kind of attachment. Um, and all of that's missing as well. He, she does give him a thimble, but that's not as an excuse for a kiss. That's because she doesn't want to kiss him in this one, because romance is not allowed in this film. Right. And, you know, in that original play, the one of the last lines talks about how he Peter Pan refuses to be touched by Wendy. She wants to just touch him, but he knows that that would that would change everything because it would make him have to acknowledge that he needs to be this real person and grow up and and actually acknowledge that he needs to be in the real world. So he doesn't even let her do that. And that's the whole point is that the love of a real woman, which Tinkerbell is not a real woman, she's just this fantasy. The real of a love real woman would actually change him and make force him to grow up so he turns away from that yeah 
Um, and you know, if, if you go, John Barry wrote a, sorry, James Barry wrote um, a, an epilogue as well uh, after the fact, which sort of covers what happens once the story's ended. Um, and Peter has disappeared for, for many years and he comes back to him. It's only a day because he doesn't really give a damn about the people he made friends with. To Wendy, it's been years. She's married. She's grown up. She's got a kid. She's kind of bitter and sad that he forgot about her. He's bitter and sad that she moved on and grew up. Um, but it also it's also revealed that he forgot everything about Captain Hook. He forgot everything about Tinkerbell. He forgot everything he'd ever done and everything he'd ever known because pivotal to his nature and his character is that being an eternal child means you never form memories and so you never form real attachments and so you can never be a fully rounded human being. It's a tragic tale, whereas this one just has him... I, I, what actually even happens? He almost grows in this one. There's a great moment when... Um, Captain Hook falls into the water because he has no happy memories and it's all Peter's fault. And you think, okay, Peter's clearly really sad. He's going to learn something from this. And by the laws of the universe, this changes Neverland and he grows up. He's in the middle of that. And Wendy taps him on the shoulder and says, I'm bored now and I want to go home. So, well done. <laughs> Can't have him thinking too much, you know. I have a question uh, about uh, the, the film. Uh, it's the same question that kind of looms over all of these remakes. Do you think that this film benefits or in any way justifies its existence through being a live action film compared to the original animated film no not in the slightest it's awful well like the <laughs> film making itself is not very interesting i mean like the, not at all the yeah. in, in terms of like the cinema just looks so so ter she's like so terribly animated she's not even she doesn't even give off the light that she's supposed to give off she's just like so dark and then yet there's like a light source everywhere you're not even sure why there's a theory to this. Like, I'll, I'll talk about different aspects of it. Like, uh, in terms of the Tinkerbell thing, I, I think, and I could be wrong, but I think if they tried to make her glow like they did in the animated movie, it would kind of undo the fact that she's played by a black actress, and so <laughs> and they couldn't That's do true. it. So they, they had to keep her like that. Some way they could have at least yeah, they, chocolate her or they, something, something. She could have had some halo or something. But yeah, the, the result is she yeah. just looks really dull and and kind of like washed out. And she's quite often shown in darkness as well, so she kind of blends into the background. She's just not very interesting. In fact, there's more I can say about her character because um, they do away with the fundamental aspect of of her character arc from the original movie. Mm -hmm. um, the general cinematography is just it, it's like a discount pirates of the caribbean i think that's the best way i could describe it you know the the, the cgi looks dog shit um you know it seems the, like uh the live action films are becoming a, a lot more assembly line the longer that they mm -hmm. go on in the same way that the marvel filmmaking has kind of deteriorated in their desire to like make sure that they're consistently delivering these types of films because the, of obviously like disney sort of objectives as a business of like having you know their films on disney plus or released theatrically that they've just got to keep pumping them out like year after year yeah there, there's definitely there's some good shots where like the galleon like lifts up into the air and it turns over and stuff and it's kind of all right um there's other scenes where they're flying over neverland or over london and it just looks awful um but you can tell this movie was done on a bit of a budget but it's right like, it doesn't it doesn't look great but I was curious to ask all of you, especially because I haven't seen it, is they have at least one actor in this film, right? Jude Law? How is he as mm -hmm. Hook? Was, He's uh, good. Mm. I mean, he was it, 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 it's, yeah, it's the classic thing of, of a good actor with a crappy script, I think. Mm. You know, because they completely change Hook's backstory. You know, in the, in the original, he was just an evil pirate guy. It's like, fine. He, he absolutely relishes being evil and he fucking loves it. And it's, it's good. You know, he's theatrical. He's over the top. He's grandiose. Uh, here, they, they change his backstory so that he was once a lost boy himself. He was actually the first, and he was Peter's best friend. But he missed his mother, and so he went off, uh, left Nether Neverland sorry, in search of her, and um, got lost at sea, and he was adopted by the pirates. They raised him, they made him one of their own, and he eventually rose to, to command them. Um, so, a nice story. You know, he found his own hmm. family. But then he returned to Neverland uh, to, to reunite with Peter, Peter couldn't accept the fact that he was grown up now, and so he cut his fucking hand off and fed it to a crocodile. Like, what? he mutilated a man and fed it to an animal. This guy's an absolute psychopath. Uh, <laughs> you know, and this is the thing, like, that happens in the that original guy. story, but it was it, not justified, but it's, it's it can be explained by the fact that Captain Hook was an evil guy who just wanted to kill Peter, but now it's like he's this sympathetic villain who's actually got a tragic backstory, 
And Peter is just this merciless psycho who mutilates him and feeds bits of him to animals. Like yeah, there's, there's that moment kind of late on when that they're fighting on top of the pirate ship and, and Hook goes to fall off. Peter grabs him and tries to teach him how to fly again and says, think happy thoughts. And Hook just stares at him and says, Peter, I haven't got any. And it's your <laughs> fault is the implication you took yes. him from him. You left him like this, but no consequences. This is the, the, the problem when you have to go and give backstories to everything is that you do invite loads of questions, moral questions and emotional questions that you don't need to. But if you are going to do that, you have to answer those questions. And this film What's doesn't. What's the variables of uh, adaptation, right? Like when you introduce new elements, you can't necessarily look at what the original story had and just pull straight from that and then be fine, right? Like there's extra work that you may need to do depending on the choices yes. that you make. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. the, There's no is the laziest really done. Yeah. The laziest way to do an adaptation, right, is to say, I'm going to tie together all these things that weren't actually related in the original story, so it's all connected. That's the lazy way to do something like this, because it's like, it seems superficially smart. You know, so instead of like Hook just being an evil pirate guy who wants to kill Peter, now it's like, oh, he's actually got this deep history with him, he used to lost boy himself, and that adds an extra layer of pathos to his character. But you don't stop to think about the long-term implications of that, like, story-wise. It even echoes through into the actual main plot line. Like, for example, he's searching for Peter's hideout, okay? And it's only Wendy singing, like, a lullaby to the, the kids that, like, uh, clues him into where they're at. But it's like, you were a lost boy yourself. You should fucking know where Peter Pan's hideout is. Your name is literally written on the door in this yeah, place. you were there, right. don't you remember? <laughs> like... Yeah. It's it's like, uh, a lot of these films can run into that problem because it's almost like as part of justifying their existence they need to be because a lot of these films are pretty short um like a lot of the older disney animated films right. are pretty short most of them are less than 90 minutes usually these ones end up being closer to two hours i think it was found out that like the new little mermaid is going to be like 40 50 minutes longer than the original it's like well that's yeah. that's time you got to fill with new material <laughs> And how congruent that material is with whatever you're pulling from the uh, the original, you know, like it, yeah, it can cause problems. This is the it's strange thing about this one as well, which is that it is almost twice as long as the original, and yet they abridge most of the key plot points from the original. So there's less uh, content huh. in that, um, and they somehow don't fill the time with anything. So the, the, the 53 version is very efficient. There's always like two, always a minimum of two plot things going on at once. So when one stops, you go to the other one. Um, with this film, they, they get to the end of a significant beat, and then there's nothing. And it's an excuse for people just to walk around and occasionally one of the characters will tell Wendy how brilliant she is. And then we move on again, but nothing substantive happens. In the meantime, what the biggest plot change that I think they made is that um, obviously in the original, Tinkerbell, very jealous of Wendy, tries to betray Wendy. She goes, she gets captured by Hook, she gives the location away, and that puts Peter Pan in mortal peril. None of that happens in this, so Tinkerbell isn't really a character, she has no moral agency. Instead, Captain Hook just shoots the kids down when they arrive and they have to go and rescue the brothers. But there's no replacement for the Tinkerbell arc in this, so there's no actual character strife that forms. All of the female characters love each other as opposed to being jealous of each other, so they don't really form off of each other. Um, and it just becomes this long, drawn-out, empty thing with no characters and minimal story compared to a much shorter film with much more story, which did everything better. Do you think there was an element yeah, of, like, we just don't want to show female character, or sorry, female relationships in a negative light, and so we have to show right. them all being, like, super supportive, and they all get on great with each other, and, you know, it's like we can't have any bitchiness or jealousy or anything like that, especially over a man. That's, that's a big no-no in Disney today. You know the um right. the re references and to changing histories or intertwining like with remakes and stuff. Uh, I don't think they're ever going to be beaten by the Cruella one. Where if you <laughs> told us, <laughs> yeah, context, that was actually on my mind. Cruella Deville will be given the history that Dalmatians killed her mum like that. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, <laughs> you know what the dogs just. Was? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. yeah not sure of a cliff. Or, uh, it's cliff. hilarious <laughs> and absolutely pathetic at the same time. It's they were they were it's, dogs that were just protecting their owner right? as well. Well, the, they yeah. were just protecting their owner. That's like literally was, what they were uh, trained to do. Emma Thompson, right? She she had she had set up the whole situation. Uh, no, with it, yeah, but uh, wait, the villain. The, the oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Tom, yeah, like I think she'd orchestrated it so the Dalmatians would run up and push her off a cliff. Mm. <laughs> Oh man, that it was so fascinating to because I hadn't watched the uh, original Dalmatians in a long time, and uh, watching that one, and then like the contrast in quality between the original animated film with all of the charm of the medium compared to that film was very depressing. <laughs> I, I think that 
there's two facets to this because one there's the fact that like when you shoot things in live action it's never going to be as as interesting visually as the animated movies it's not going to be as colorful it's not going to be as vibrant it's the characters aren't going to be as expressive especially if you're dealing with animals like it's just it's not going to work uh you know lion king's taught us that little mermaid's about to teach us um but also the, there's this weird it filters through into Peter Pan as well. This weird attempt to reframe all the villains as like, well, they're not actually evil. They're just misunderstood, and and they've all got tragic backstories and stuff that justify who they are. Um, and I just I can't shake the feeling that there's just a really sinister air to it. It's almost like, well, once you accept that there's no real good or bad in in anything, then well, pretty much anything's permissible. Then you can you can justify virtually anything because it's just a matter of perspectives. And I don't quite like that because there was something just intrinsically uh, pure, I guess, about the good and evil struggle of a lot of these old Disney movies. You know, it was nice to know that good triumphs over evil and like some of the bad guys were just genuinely bad people, you know, that, that kind yeah. of deserved what they got. And but it's weird because a lot of the modern way of thinking is very much about vilifying people and saying, you know, you're you're wrong for your beliefs, so we don't even need to talk to you. So I, it's so strange that then in the movies you can't have just purely evil people because that's that's completely contrast with how they talk. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, in terms of Peter Pan, like it's uh, the, this movie. As they say, it's always nice to see yourself represented. And so um, out of all the main characters that I can think of, uh, you've got Wendy, who's uh, a girl, who's uh, a black woman. You've got uh, Tiger Lily, who's a Native American woman. Mm -hmm. And I, I was, and you've got Peter Pan himself, who is Asian. And is I was like, like where's, the, where's the white man? I was like, ah, OK, it's Captain Hook, the villain. <laughs> that's yeah, where i am you know? I like to be it's nice to see myself time. on screen <laughs> <laughs> i would like to see myself on screen but tinkerbell was just too dark where i couldn't even see her in any of the shots so <laughs> it's uh yeah like the the one we hadn't covered as well was tiger lily who um yeah. I, I that was always going to be a difficult one because that the original 1950s movie yeah, I can see why people would take issue with the the depiction of Native Americans in that one. That's uh, it's pretty stereotypical when you see her tribe. Um, yeah. But the, the the way they overcompensate for it now is like they kind of just write the rest of her tribe out of it. They're barely in the story, and then her role is almost what would I even describe it? It's like she's kind of the the leader of the Lost Boys almost. Like yeah, when, because Peter's not there most of the time, or he's not interested in leading them, so she kind of organizes them. Uh, she's always given them orders. She takes charge of most of the situations. And when Peter gets mortally wounded, falls through a fucking floor and somehow doesn't. She's the one who nurses him back to health. And so she, heal, she heals him with mystical herbs. And then otherwise, she she, she occasionally spouts <laughs> pseudo mystical this, this herbs. Is... That's that's the one. She occasionally spouts this sort of pseudo spiritual bullshit, which is supposed to sound wise as well. The the actress gave an interview where she said that she knew that Disney was finally going to do the character justice. Um, and notwithstanding, <laughs> yeah, okay, complaints about the the stereotypical nature of the original one. Um, which of the two characters is actually more important to the story? Which one accomplishes more and is more pivotal and shows us more about the world? Is it the original one or this one? Well, this one occasionally wields a sword. She gets slow mo hero shots whenever she does, which is very cringe. Otherwise, she doesn't really do anything. She's less important, and apparently, that's being done justice. Yeah, well, yeah, it's one all of her lines was to say that, you know, because she's trying to encourage Wendy to be okay with growing up. And she says, you know, as I've learned from my ancestors, you have to hold your ancestors and your past in your heart and then, you know, move forward, I don't know, with courage or whatever. But it's so interesting because in all of the interviews related to making this movie, not one person brought up the original work. Like talk about appropriating someone's culture without actually understanding the what the original work was at all no one has anything good to say about barry no one actually inf like invokes his name at all it's like this is someone else's work this is someone who like spent a lifetime trying to understand like human beings and put something together because he saw that a friend of his who had young children she passed away right the, the mother who 
who inspired the character of of Wendy and of like his his love for mothers and the role that they play for for little boys, right? And there's no acknowledgement of that at all. Yep. It, well, I imagine he's too problematic now. Um, they they wouldn't want to acknowledge a writer like him, you know, coming from it's a different really generation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, you you ask yourself like, well, how do they how do they almost get the rights to 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 uh, reimagine stories like this with such um, with such creative freedom that they seem to have because um, they they've clearly changed like pretty pivotal aspects of the story to suit their desire to meet modern trends or modern ideals and you know who who governs that is there an estate of uh, of jm barry who who kind of says yes or no to this or do they Peter just Pan have the right to all public domain right <clears throat> i imagine at this point because it was written in 19 <laughs> like the beginning of the 20th century right so that's probably uh public domain well, I, I don't know because I think you know be. the the descendants of a of an author can still retain the rights to to his work. You know, in the same he way that he gave like, away the rights. Public. He gave away the rights to a, a children's hospital, like before he died. So when right. Disney made the movie, they gave they gave thanks to that that hospital for giving them the right to do it. So I don't know if Disney owns it from them, but he he mm -hmm. hasn't owned it. Yeah, since he passed away. Yeah. And then there's also like if this is, you know, like partially because it's an adaptation of the animated film, which itself was right. an adaptation of the original story. Mm -hmm. But I mean, as for like the, you know, the, the these films justify their existence based on like the fact that they are existing things that people know and like. Um, it's like it's a way easier sell than doing something completely original. And I mean, it reflects in the box office numbers for a lot of these live action remakes, like a billion dollars for a lot of them. Like that's a good enough reason for Disney to keep making them. Um, it is. Yeah. I mean, there's um. It's also it's even the, the stuff that they did add. I mean, I'm sort of hesitate to call it a reimagining because that implies imagination went into it. Um, but <laughs> even the, the new things that they added, so that there was a book in 2017. I can't remember the name of the author. Um, I think it was called just called Lost Boy, and that was where you have more of Hook's backstory as is presented in this film. Um, and the idea that he was exiled by Peter has been like a fan theory on Reddit for about a decade. Um, so it's not even as though they've really come up with brand new things to do with this. They do seem to have just done a cursory Google search and found the two most recent things they could possibly add and then cut all of the interesting stuff out in order to add it and then not really done anything with the stuff that they added. So it's, yeah, it's it's not great. Yeah, it was just, you know, my my ultimate takeaway from it was like okay, take away all the the identity politics crap and, and the the characters that they've stripped mine for anything interesting, and you end up with just a movie that's really dull. It's it's really dull and uninteresting, oh, and yeah. the characters are flat. I had no interest in anyone who was in it. I didn't care what happened to anyone. Um, it was just mm. just a completely Peter unrewarding Pan's experience. Acting. The acting by oh, me so yeah. bad. Yeah. Poor thing to go up against Jude Law. Like it's so embarrassing. Like he's such a kid. He's just a kid, and it's it's not his fault. He's not good at this. Like why did they pick him? It's like audition level acting, where you just take a random guy, like a random actor off the street or whatever, and just give him the lines. That's that's the level like, of hey, like kid. commitment. Yeah, yeah it's, it's... Like, I started out being quite critical of him in my video, but then as it went on, and all of the rest of the acting was all quite sort of amateur dramatics as well. And in the end, I, I was less annoyed by his depiction just because everybody else was pretty equivalently shit. The, the exception is probably Jude Law, but even his version of Hook is kind of stilted. He doesn't have. I, I think that the reason for that though is that Smee is barely in the film, and so that if you go back to any good mm -hmm. performance of Hook, it's usually because there's a comedic double act. He has the ideal foil in Smee, and Smee is this. You know, he's so unsuited to the task of pirating, and he's so much the opposite of Hook himself that there's always some very, very strong dynamic that they can play off there. But Smee being barely in the film doesn't give Jude Law a chance to do much interesting with the character, and so yeah, he's clearly the most competent actor there, and he gives the best performance there. But even that is pretty bland compared to what we've had in the recent past mm -hmm. and i was i was looking up some just some details about this because i'm trying to write a video for next week and i found out that the tradition with the play was that the same person who played the father wendy's father 
typically yeah. also played Captain Hook. And I thought, how cool would it have been if they had actually had the actor that they picked for the, I forget his name right now, he's the guy from Firefly, um, but the mm -hmm. actor who played Wendy's father, if he had done yeah. Hook, that would have been awesome. I love Jude Law, but you know, I think it, it could have been better. Was it I think, again, there's Alan Tudyk. Who, uh, yeah, the, the guy, uh, yeah, the guy, who, the guy who played Steve the pirate in Dodgeball. <laughs> that's what I'll always oh, yeah. remember him as. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. and there's um, a reason for that tradition, though, which is that, and and again, the fifty three film sets this up quite clearly, which is that the, the father is sort of set up as the villain in the first sort of not quite the first act, but the first scene. The the, the father stands against the imagination the children want to run wild. So the father is an incredibly pivotal character because he's the he's kind of the proximate bad guy. And so when you have him played by the same person who plays Hook, that's kind of the, the dramatic expansion of his character. What you're doing is you're harking back to the fact that the villain is the adult, the adult is the father, and the father is a villain because he tells you to grow up and he tells you not to use your imagination, and he tries to bring you down. Um, and the nice payoff to that is that the, at the end of most of the traditional tellings, the father recognises the ship as it sails away, and remembers something of his own childhood, and becomes much nicer to Wendy as a result of that. And that's, that's a nice middle ground that they reach, but again, all of that's completely absent because the father's barely in this one. Yeah, they don't also, know what to, like, they don't know what they, the meaning of it. Like, I always interpreted it as, like, Hook is just, he's meant to represent the negative aspects of adulthood. You know, he's hes overbearing, he's scary, he's like, he's, he's big, terrifying for a child, from a child's perspective. And that's thats how they would perceive adults if you're a young child. You know, there are these big, coarse, particularly men, um, you know, terrifying figures. Um, and that's, it absolutely, it, it makes sense then that uh, the same actor who played the father would also be Captain Hook because it's like you could you could interpret the whole thing as just like well a child's um, flight of fancy to to rationalize their fear of growing up like that's mm -hmm. their fears are embodied by their father figure because that's that's their standard of measure for what an adult man is uh, and it's 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 an interesting thing to play with the psychology of that is really cool but then yeah like you say they they abandon all of that because they don't even consider it it's not it's not uh, that level of thinking this movie yeah and in, mm. in the 50s book wendy comes to see that her father's right that she does need to grow up so it is like it's that meeting in the middle right the father sees the perspective of being a child the child sees the perspective of seeing, being an adult yeah well you know um the wendy's the middle ground like you say you know the the father and hook represent the the, the terrifying um fear of, of growing up and and what it means to lose your childish imagination and sense of adventure Peter Pan represents the the free spirited, um, boundless possibilities of of childish innocence and uh, and imagination. Um, neither one is complete. Neither one is is ideal or, or perfect as they are. Wendy is the one who finds that middle ground. A child who retains their imagination, but also the the maturity that's needed to grow up and progress to that next stage, to then go on and live a fulfilling life. You know, she she finds that that balance between the two extremes. That's that's again an interesting thing, and it it, it ties back into this idea that um, I don't necessarily want to know Hook's background because he's not really a person. He's a he's an archetype. He represents something rather than being a person in his own right. Same with Peter Pan. Yeah, the implication is as well that he only exists because the children imagine him to. So Neverland in in Barry's imagining was always different depending on which child was there and which child had dreamt of it before he went. Um, and so it's, and you see them talking about sort of the, the story of Peter Pan before they go to Neverland. And, so, and there's a pirate called Hook and I imagine that this bay full of mermaids and then they go there and lo and behold, there is a pirate called Hook and there is a bay full of mermaids. Um, and it's sort of ambiguous as to whether or not that's always the case, but it's sort of, it's implied that that isn't always the case. That is just because that's the children's imagination. The world has been shaped by their own creative imagination. And it's not this, this unending thing, which is what allows Peter to forget all of it whenever he goes and comes back again, because none of it's really real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to play with there, like thematically and in terms of like the ideas you want to explore. But uh, again, like the, yeah. it just feels like the, the people who made this movie just didn't really think about any of that stuff. It's like, nah, it's not important. <laughs> yeah, and I think we were talking about how the women were all very friendly with each other, which fine, I, I understand why they want to push that, ne you know, women shouldn't be competitive with each other because there's this weird belief that the only reason women compete with each other is because that's what men want. That's what men want from us, which I don't agree with that, obviously. Um, but 
it's also interesting is that in any of any story that's properly nuanced, it shows that there are roles that are played by men and by women, and they can interchange. But the fact of it is that the men need the women and the women need the men and they add they add value to each other. But in all these newer movies and including this one, it's always that the woman does not need the man in any way. If she needs anyone, it is another woman. And that is it. There's never a need for her. And it, like Peter Pan is useless in this. Yeah, she, Wendy saves him three or four times, I think. She, so she saves him from Hook when he goes to stab him the first time um, by distracting him. She saves him when he's falling out of the ship because she can That's fly and true. he can't at that point. She saves him when Hook goes to stab him again and she tells Hook to grow up and that presages him falling off the ship seemingly to his death. Um, and yet I don't think Peter actually wins a fight in this at all. Uh, God. Yeah, he definitely he does, just, he doesn't I think he just wins by apologizing. That's it. He just stops well, it by apologizing, right? Well, you know what's a really pivotal scene as well? Like in the in the fifty three movie, uh, when Wendy walks the plank, it's Peter who saves her. She falls mm. off, he grabs her. Uh, I just I knew this was going to happen. I fucking knew it. <laughs> what well, going into this movie, I knew the rules of modern <laughs> di Disney dictate you can't have a man save a woman. It's not allowed, and so she has to save herself. Like. And they can't Very even good. just um, they can't even just depict that either, can they? They they have no, to say they have to get that overtly. line. So she flies yeah. up. And uh. Hook says, "You've got the boy's magic," and she says, "This magic belongs to no boy." And I uh. thought, oh, "You did so well, film, only making cringe. me cringe a bit." But now you've just ruined all of that good work. Yeah, they yeah. had to get it, and it's like. Yeah, it's like a drug addict or something, you know, and you put like a big line next to them. Like, you know, they want it. They want it so bad and they can't help themselves. And, you know, sooner or later they're going to cave. And they did. Like, they had to get it in. And in you can movie. see it coming before it even happens. Like, don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. Oh, she did it. Oh, God. The story, it belongs to a man. Are we going to acknowledge that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, if they could have got away with it, they would have called it Wendy and Peter Pan. Yeah. They absolutely would have, because that's what yeah, that's but, their narrative focus. But what's interesting is that the original play is actually called Peter Pan and Wendy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a bridge to Peter so, Pan later on, wasn't it? I think. Right. Um, there, there was a film called Wendy, which came out, I think, in two thousand and twenty, um, which is the one of the adaptations I actually haven't seen, but. From I've seen little bits and pieces of it. It doesn't seem quite so obnoxious as this one does, even. Um, and that's supposedly a, a retelling solely to recenter the focus of the story around that character. But they they seem to do a slightly more subtle job with that. Yeah. Very interesting. I do um, that. It, it just it kind of feels like we we got the worst version of all of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just give give me Hook. I, I would watch Hook again any day of the week. It was really fun. Yeah. You know. Um, it was. It was. But it's good that stuff like this kind of forces us to, like, would we really care about Peter Pan if there wasn't this attack of the story? I mean, I think we care because it is so, it's like, it's like, it's such an old story. It's, we all know it. Everyone knows the story. It's like, we wouldn't care to try to talk about why it's important if it wasn't under attack. Well, I think, yeah, always with, with things like this. You know, it's fine it, to some extent if you want to, like, create your own new story. And if it's garbage, well, it's, it's garbage. You know, I'm not going to lose too much sleep over it. But when you appropriate someone else's work, uh, particularly someone who's no longer even alive to give their consent for this stuff, and you, you take it over and you produce some shit version of it, uh, how are we meant to react except to, to condemn you for it? You know, like, what are we going to do? Like, thank you for, for ruining something that was once really uh, beloved, you know, particularly something that st stood the test of time for, like, decades. Um, yeah, it, it's a really tough yeah. one. And it's the same It's the same mentality, I guess. In mm -hmm. Star Wars movies, the Star Trek um, reboots, um, you know, Doctor Who, all of these things that, that have been around for generations and, um, you know, standing on the shoulders of previous generations of, of writers and creatives uh, and, and slapping your shit version on top of it and expecting to get credit for it. Uh, of course, people are going to be mad about it because you didn't earn this yeah. position that you're in. Yeah. 
Absolutely. So you wouldn't recommend it? <laughs> I wouldn't recommend <laughs> no, it. But no, but Mahler, you should watch it. <clears throat> you should go I avoid through the hell these that we did. Until the one time I have to watch it for like an EFAP movies recording, that'll be the exception. I, I, I just, I think you would find it really interesting just to watch the the, the animated movie again from the fifties, and then. Oh, that's watch what we'll this. do. We'll probably do that hook and this because that would be a fun jump through history. We did it for Cruella with the uh, 101 Dalmatians original, which is fantastic, and then the original yeah. live action remake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the first live action, the was one close, which she's a treasure in those movies. Yep. yep. <laughs> She's insane and captures it perfectly. <laughs> but hey, that is that is Peter Pan and Wendy. We do not recommend mm -hmm. it. So there we go. And yeah, I don't mm -hmm. think anyone else does as well if the audience ratings anything to go by. Um but on the subject of terrible writing, we might soon be freed from it, at least <laughs> <laughs> it's go on strike. Oh no, what a loss. Um but this is an interesting one because you get to see how it trickles down through the industry, I suppose. Um, the the things that are most immediately impacted are the stuff that's done like almost day to day, uh, i.e., the late night talk shows. And yeah. you'll be you'll be shocked to learn that uh, what's going to be going first of all. Yeah, Pinko, just got... a heads up. You keep you keep dropping out at random parts, but we're we're able to keep up. Yeah, like oh, it, I'm sorry. it pauses and then you talk really fast and then it catches back up. Like, <laughs> God damn it. If it gets really bad, I'll, when... cu I'll cut, cut out the, cl the critical doggo. Um, that might be drawing on my connection. Okay. Um, but yeah, <laughs> hopefully it won't come to that. That'll be the trivia. Lars is like, yeah. wow, dude. Like, I get booted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, she's you contributing a lot it. to this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, in terms of late night talk shows, we are losing Stephen Colbert, Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, uh, and possibly, uh, yeah, we the Kelly Clarkson show. Oh no, what is Does anybody loss? actually watch like these late night shows anymore? Does anybody watch them, or do they? Just I mean, watch I'm, <laughs> I mean, Americans, help me out here because it's not really a thing for us Brits. We just don't give a shit about it. But I mean, do you? Apparently, they're still going, right? Am I the only American here or anybody else? You are the only American. Lara I'm is British American. and the rest of us are <laughs> and friggin' <laughs> Australian. I, I mean, I only watch clips of it later if I'm doing research on a particular actor or something, then I'll come across it. But no, I, I and I don't know anyone who stays up and watches that. Like, oh, yeah. let me turn that on. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's gone. It's so because, weird that it's not even just one of them that's successful. Apparently, there's like so many, and it's ugh, like, uh, they're so generic. Yeah, yeah. I think this the is... last really good one was who's that? Who's the Scottish man who who hosted? Craig a... Ferguson. Craig Ferguson. There you go. Like his and his he, was great. He got followed up. James Corden took over that one. Uh, yeah, James Corden. <laughs> the guy who fucking Corden, nobody likes. Yeah, well, America rejects James Corden. I, 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 I can say this right on behalf of all the Brits here and in chat. I apologize <laughs> for the existence of James Corden. I don't know how the fuck he ended up in America doing late night talk shows, but I am sorry that you inherited him. Just like I'm sorry you inherited yeah. Harry as well. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we're sorry for Meghan, and we're sorry that like, the one Brit that decides to be in this role is someone like James Corden. He's like the worst Brit. Give us yeah. anyone else, literally. It's, it's, it's the new form of the special relationship. We just pawn off our worst possible people on each other <laughs> and hope that you'll keep them. Uh, yeah. it's, it's worth mentioning, I think all of us would treat Conan O'Brien separately from, from uh, the rest Yeah, of them. pretty much. I yes. think that he's... Uh, but his show's over now, too, I think. I think it recently ended. Yeah, so... Yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, yeah. he's been, he's been he doing so this good. stuff longer than we've been alive, I think. He's been, he's been doing it for like 30 years. years. 30 yeah. years. I think yeah, he had... I, mean, uh, I think after David Letterman retired, he was the longest uh, running, like, late night talk show host. Yeah, yeah, and he really got betrayed with the whole Jay Leno situation. So that was uh, really uh, the whole trajectory. Yeah, uh, yeah that was... Yeah, that, that, was, was, uh, that was... That was... That uh, was... That was shambles. Yeah, but I wish Craig Ferguson had continued because his whole I idea of breaking that format, that making it, you know, allowing there to be an awkward pause, like let it be natural. He never like just it was never like the scripted thing, which is what every other show has been. It was it was so good. It was genuine. Yeah. 
but th those are the uh, those are the initial casualties, and then I think I guess it in order of like uh, regularity uh, of the show. So like I imagine the daytime soaps would be next because they they have to produce scripts on a regular right. basis, and then mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, yeah, the last to fall would be the the network TV um, series, and then like movies and stuff. So like with films particularly, there would be a lot that's already in the can, and it's uh, it's kind of ready to shoot, so less of an issue. Um, but it does, I I guess it kind of depends on how long this goes on for, because it takes me back to the writer's strike in what, 2008? 2007, yeah. 2007, sorry. Um, well, 2007 eight, yeah. That was about four yeah, months. Yes, um, and so many shows absolutely bombed after that, like Lost fell off a cliff. I think Heroes really suffered, didn't it? Because that had been flying high at the time, yeah. and then it absolutely died a death because of the writer's strike. The quality of the quality of the writing just and, uh, died a, a little known fact that well actually i'm pretty sure a lot of people know this i think the writers guild the the strike back then reduced the episodes in season one of breaking bad from i think it was meant to be 13 to 7 right. um and i believe it actually it's it saved uh jesse it, it meant that he was he got to stay in uh the show because it was originally planned that he was gonna it was somebody was gonna die in the first season but the writer's strike disrupted that wow um, yeah there were a I lot of films that. that got uh, disrupted. I know Transformers 2 was a notor notorious <laughs> uh, product of the writer's strike. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's disruptive. And it's and I guess it's interesting now with, like, the the nature of the industry. Like, how does this, what is the knock-on effect on, like, uh, something like Marvel that's so assembly line that they want to make sure that they're churning out, like, three movies a year or three TV shows a year? What does it look like in a year or two? Yeah. Just it's going to depend bold. on how... Sorry, after you. Uh, yeah, I guess it's it's ultimately going to depend on how long this goes on for before they get a resolution. Because you know, if it's it's just a few weeks, then okay, fine, like you can resume production relatively quickly. But uh, yeah, if this if this drags on like the previous one for months on end, uh, it's going to have massive problems. Well, so what are the uh, what are the broad sort of objectives of the strike? Because I'm still I still don't have a, a great idea of like what uh, is desired. There's a few of them. So some of them are similar to the 2008 strike. You can usually tell sort of the, the trend in which an industry is going by the demands a union makes to stop it, because most of these strikes are protectionist in one way or another. So whereas 2008 was largely concerned with um, remuneration and sort of royalties from TV shows as opposed to movies and from DVD sales as opposed to uh, theater sales, some part of this one is that, uh, generally speaking, royalties for streaming services are not as high or at least equitable with royalties for a, a cinematic release or a traditional sort of cable TV show. So that's one. The more interesting one, though, um, is that they, one of the demands is that studios make a, a solemn promise and commitment never to use AI to generate script ideas or scripts themselves which oh. suggests that the writers are slightly worried that given they already write like automatons, they might eventually be replaced by them. Mm -hmm. There is a worry about AI on their behalf. Uh, there's just quotes about them saying, we want more money, we want enough money to make a basic living what, doing what we love. Which um, I thought writers were paid a decent chunk considering the work that they do on when it comes there to are, specific there's, topics. There are some other ones, though. it's not a cheap place to live, uh, California. It's not a cheap place to live. And also, this, there are certain studio practices which are evolving, which are cheaper for studios and pay writers less. So the, 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 te the tendency now to have what they call, uh, what's it called? I think it's called a quick room or a short room or something instead of creating a pilot episode. You get the writers together to sort of pitch the script to a studio and that's the decision the studio will make on whether or not to pick up that show. But writers aren't paid as much because it's not as time intensive um, if they just sit in a room for a little bit and then turn up like this tiny draft script as opposed to actually, you know, being given the whole job of scripting an entire episode, which goes to where. Um, and so they're getting paid less for that. And th there's sort of shorter contracts and the typical charge of turning writing into a gig economy where people are sort of paid by the hour as opposed to paid on contract. Um, so there's a whole bundle of them, um, most of which are to do with pay, um, some of which are slightly more valid than others, I think. It's just a bold move, I think, to be starting to demand higher pay in an era when your writing is tanking. I mean, it's off a cliff. So yeah. what exactly should... What, what's your leverage here? Pay us more to turn out crap um, is not the strongest argument. Is there any leverage that comes from the timing of this? Is Because the impression I get is that the industry is like, oh, you know, like it's not, it's not, not in a great. great place when it comes to making lots of money at the well, moment. Considering, 
Was it Spielberg often... said recently that Tom Cruise saved Hollywood with Maverick? Saved theatrical, so... yeah, releases. Um, yeah, it certainly wasn't really... Steven Spielberg that saved it with West Side Story, that's for sure. That film <laughs> All the Fablemans, <laughs> right? Neither did very yeah. well. No, that was a yeah. bit of a self-congratulatory like pat on the back for himself, you know? <laughs> That's right. He, he can do a little bit of pad. He's been around for a while. I mean, he's, he's earned it a little bit, yeah. But it's like, don't expect the, like the world to go nuts over a movie like that, you know? No. Yeah, no. that's more like a home that. movie. Show that at your Christmas party or something. <laughs> yeah, um, but it just it, it kind of feels like with with the writers of Hollywood at the moment. I feel like we're not losing an awful lot. Like, I would love to see just a big old reset of, of the creative pool that we have available because when I look at the, the movies that have been put out over the past few years, I think we'd all agree that, like, generally this the standard has been absolute dog shit and I don't really support their, their demands for more money because they're not fucking worth it. What they've produced hasn't been worth it. Yeah. No, and strikes as well like this to, to get sort of stricter contracts, tighter contracts, longer contracts with much more money do end up having the effect of stopping newer, younger writers from actually making their mark in the industry to begin with because it becomes much harder for them to actually get a job. Um, because many, many studios will have arrangements with specific unions, for example. I know this is this is certainly true for some studios that do voice acting work. Uh, you have to get a special um, waiver from certain unions to be allowed to employ non-union staff to do voice parts if you're, if you're mm. contracting out, which is difficult, um, and it makes things more expensive. Um, and of course, the longer your contract is, then, well, the, the fewer writers will be brought onto that team over time. Whereas you can sometimes see the effect when there are strikes like this happening, if there's an arrangement with a studio which allows it to use non-union staff, well, some people being drafted in to do sort of last minute script for late night won't have had these jobs before. And so you get a slightly more bold, freewheeling approach. And I think that was one of the effects of the 2008 strike as well. The show's very much changed in character and actually in some ways become a bit more inventive because they weren't hamstrung by long contracts for the same old writers. Broadly, what they're after at least from my knowledge, is increased pay, better residuals, staffing requirements, uh, shorter exclusivity deals, and an assurance on AI, which is like... The AI I think is fantastic. All of, all of this is a lot. And like when you get into the specifics of what they're after, it's like, fucking, I don't know, man. And then you, you wonder, like, how valuable... Because I was trying to ask uh, Gary and Az about this when we were talking about Real BBC. I was just thinking about, like... You know your average director who's maybe been making a show for a while or something and their writers are like not writing this now like is it if, assuming he's not a part of the union doesn't have as much investment below it's like could, could he write for the time being could they do improv like what exactly and i'm assuming it's different for every single project be it tv movies whatever else but um you know until this gets sorted but as you were just about to say the assurance on ai one is so fascinating because mm -hmm. You'd want to be in a position where you're like, no, AI, AI would not be able to replace us because it's not in a position to defeat our like creative enterprise. But apparently, it is, uh, which is now making us all wonder. Like, wait a minute, have you guys been using it? <laughs> like, so, so what's, what's going on? I, I'm, willing I, bet, I'm willing to bet Marvel have been using it for years. <laughs> what comes to mind is the recent South Park episode. Uh, if you guys haven't seen it, you should. It would. It's very relevant. They eventually get to the point where the episode itself is written by ChatGPT. Uh, <laughs> really fun. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's our future, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I for one, welcome our AI overlords. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope they take pity the, on us. Won't be long before the robots yeah. are outside protesting, asking for their jobs. It's like, hey. The, <laughs> no, you know what life. it'll be? It'll be like people like us. It'll, it'll be there just to entertain them, you know. Like, ah, look at the humans doing their stupid things. Like, you know, make us laugh. <laughs> they'll they'll be like the critical video. doggo on on cam, you know. We just watch. <laughs> they'll watch us doing humany things. Um, you know those videos of Boston Dynamics where people are just like test. They're really really testing these like robots that can balance and jump and do all this stuff. And then, but they're like they'll like knock them over and like poke them with a stick. And yeah. push them. And I'm like those that that's gonna be footage used against us during the trials of human beings for like savagery <laughs> against the our robotic overlords. There's There'll no come a point though, where, like when someone tries to kick one of them over, and it will just turn and like deflect it or like punch well, the guy or something, and that's when we know we're Cold done. Don't give us one of these. 
yeah. where the robot fights back. <laughs> <laughs> Give it time. Well, that's the thing. When we're in those trials, they'll be like, where were you? And what did you say when they yeah. talked about AI? And we're going to be like, oh, you, uh, I was most uh, positive, I, I think. Yeah. No, I, I was, so you I was see here, baggage it. claim that you just retweeted it and said, ha, 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 this is hilarious. What were you yep. really thinking at that time? I was you were, you were, you guys were on a live stream joking about robots getting hurt. You know, <laughs> we do that with everyone. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's what it was called, Roko's Basilisk. The idea that uh, AI might want to punish anybody who wasn't actively facilitating uh, their existence. That was the Silicon Valley. They did a joke about that of like, yeah, you know, I'll be a good little slave and sort of. Uh, <laughs> Help them out. Just nudge them along so that they don't come for me. I, I, I mean, the th the the bastion of of hu like human uh, creativity was always the thing that that set us apart, though. It was always this yeah. idea of, well, you know, a robot uh, can can do automated processes. It can it can do a human would get tired of or bored with or whatever but like a robot can just carry on doing it all day long like a factory assembly line or whatever mm. um the the one thing they didn't have was creativity they couldn't produce things they couldn't produce works of art they couldn't write stories whatever now we, we've gotten to the point where they, they kind of can um you you can definitely make the argument that like all they're doing is getting a whole bunch of existing things and just cobbling yeah. really coming up with creative ideas but uh, fuck it. That's pretty much what Hollywood does anyway. So like how how are we better than them at this point? <laughs> are we are we devolving to the point where they're actually just more creative than us just through sheer inertia if nothing else? We could probably yeah, easily get ChatGPT to write a script like a Marvel like script and it would be anything better than what's come out in Phase 5. Oh, I fully believe that. If you just fed into it the scripts for all the previous Marvel movies and the TV shows yeah. and just say, tell me an original story with X, Y, and Z characters, it could easily do it. And it would probably be yeah. better than what Marvel writers are capable of at this point. I would like to see it. Just see what they'd, they'd come up with these days even. But yeah, there's um there's a bit more information on each of the subjects that, I mean, add a little bit more context for Curious. You've got um for the pay... The Guild is seeking higher compensation for writers across the board, though there are more jobs available to the WGA members than ever before because of the proliferation of streaming services. Pay for most writers is down. Ten years ago, 33% of TV writers were paid the minimum. As of now, it's 49%. Accounting for inflation, writer pay has declined 14% in the last five years. The medium weekly writer-producer pay is down 23% over the last decade with inf uh, inflation factored in. Writers say many of the members aren't even making a living wage, though they are also seeking increases for their pension and health funds. Does it say what the average wage for a writer is? I assume this is all going to be relative to the cost of living. Cost of living in, in LA. The, yeah. yeah. So it's, it'll be it'll sound like a lot and in isolation, probably. But, yeah, because I, I, I tried to gauge this, and it's like, okay, well, say you're, you're brought in to write one episode of a tv show or be a contributing writer on it okay fine you're not, you're not gonna make a fortune off that but like say you're you're doing a steady writing gig it's like well we want you to be a, a weekly contributor on this late night talk show or something what do you get paid then can you live off that it's like it's, wonder, it's, though, do they have to can they not can they just live somewhere cheaper and still write for the same show <laughs> can, you know what i mean like, i mean do you have to physically write, yeah do you, you have, have to physically to be in yet? la uh i presume that you don't you don't need to be there, but the industry is there and like yeah, you know, networking that. and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I imagine that's a big part of it. Like having physical writers' rooms where people come in and, you know, well, you uh, almost, bounce ideas off each other. You almost want the writer to be involved to that degree, right? To get to know the actors even maybe and to get into the set and into the production. But I'm just trying to find is because uh, I well, just don't the, know that the, the requirements are going to be met even at all. I, I well, I guess the, the the question is, in terms of how long it lasts, who can outlast uh, who? Can the writers outlast yeah. the studio mm. or is it the other way around? And not necessarily outlast the studio, but get to the point where the costs that are being incurred by the studio are so large that they start to concede. And if they do, how much are they going to concede on? It's kind of like, I have no idea. I, I couldn't, I don't even know how long this could last or what the outcome is going to be. I don't know. 
There's um, I, there's I, another yeah. big um guild which is usually on contract. I can't remember the length of the contract, like six month contracts. A large number of which I think it's producers at a guess. It's one of the producers guilds, and a lot of their contracts are coming up at the end of. I think it's this month, either this month or next month. And so Why one of the other things to watch is, uh, is the strike going to then extend to them? Because if that happens, then you've got major implications for even shows that are currently in production. Because at the moment, you know, films are basically shielded because they're in the pipeline and they've been worked on for a long time and they're working to a, to a schedule anyway. But if you start getting the strike spread to other sectors, then you get a bigger problem, even for things that you thought would be shielded from this one. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if one union was very much urging the other one to, uh, to come out in solidarity that's interesting i would have thought producers are probably the most overpaid in that well ecosystem. It's, i guess it's also because you know you've got like your, your big producers but then you've also got like associate producers and stuff like that and I'm, i imagine that they probably aren't getting paid as much makes hmm. sense so it so look, sounds like this is a system-wide disruption mm-hmm Oh, yeah, you can't just be writers yeah. that are feeling the squeeze on this. It's going to be everybody involved in the production. Of well, the it's it's the that's that's kind of the nature of it, right? Like if if there's no scripts that are coming along, then production stops, which means that you've got people on the production side who aren't going to be doing work. And it's particularly important in terms of uh, we're starting to enter into the time of year where they start to do work on the upcoming season of TV, which in America starts September October, like for mm -hmm. network television, so ABC, yeah. CBS, yeah. and stuff. And so if it doesn't get resolved like soon, then those people aren't mm -hmm. going to be getting work either. And then that puts more pressure on the studio, I'd imagine, because it's like now you got other people mm -hmm. who are out of work. That's when they'll I just turn to them. AI and like the AI will like literally do the writers out of a job at this point. Like That's interesting. it's still going to go on strike. Because it's like what we need is the complete opposite, which is to just cut out all the noise, right? Like all of the network TV stuff, network TV is dead. Right. And at least in America, no. I don't I don't know what it's like everywhere else. Like the the viewership is so down, like compared to the last writer strike where network TV was so crucial. And now it's it's, you know, which shows are really big on network TV. That, now that that is it's partially true, but it's almost something that I feel like uh, we lose like shows like NCIS. They're still getting mm -hmm. watched by like millions of people um that like those kinds of shows are still successful on network tv and still get like millions of views not as high as it used to be uh but then right. it also you know, compensates with streaming right because like all of the networks have some streaming presence at this point yeah yeah uh if i could I, there's there's a bit on the staffing requirements uh if you want to go into that one unless you've got something else drink it well, I, I think the next thing I was going to talk about would be well I was going to ask baggage claim about Captain Marvel but uh we can we can talk about this a My little bit more subject. first <laughs> i wake up in the morning and go captain marvel <laughs> but anyway i will let Marvel do his do his piece first <laughs> i think it's interesting so the union wants tv shows to staff a certain amount of writers for a period of time at issue the rising practice of mini rooms where only a handful of writers mm -hmm. are working on a series such writers rooms are often employed during development before a show is greenlit that means writers can be working on a series that doesn't get picked up for as much as a year after they worked on it or not at all the process circumvents some of the protections WGA right, uh, members have from being overworked and understaffed. The use of mini rooms accelerated during the pandemic, with writers often meeting by Zoom, a still commonplace practice. So like loopholes, as well as trying to get around just all the current rules, would mean that a strike might be necessary to update everything with how things have moved along with um, streaming. But at the same time, I can't even fathom being someone who's pulling together a TV show and being like, right, I'll have two main writers so that they can bounce off each other. And then some staffing requirement from the WGA or whatever, just like you have to have at least 10 or, or six or whatever. I just feel like, um, no. It, it makes it incredibly, I, I... incredibly expensive. It tends to have the effect of actually empowering the very companies that these unions are campaigning against because the only people who can actually afford to meet those demands are the big studios. Anyone who's actually starting out trying to break into that industry uh, or trying to create a new studio with new ideas will find it very difficult to meet that requirement um and you know i think drinker you said just a few minutes ago that you know 
does this not actually make the case for AI? And there was a guy, I think it was John Lewis, he was the, the head of the American Coal Miners Union in the, I want to say the 60s. Um, and he became known as the greatest oil salesman of the century because he took all the coal miners out on strike and refused to work. And so there was a huge transition over to oil because it was much cheaper and you didn't have to meet the union's demands for that. Um, it's not right. impossible that something similar, I think AI probably is a little way off at the moment, but it's not impossible you do find some sort of knock-on effect like that. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's like you, you're essentially striking yourself out of existence. Uh, it's very, it would be not inconceivable that the studios might say, let's, let's run the AI for a few episodes of this TV show, see what it produces. And we'll have some, um, some moderately talented non-union people, uh, to, to proofread it and see if it makes sense. And wow, maybe it will. And it's like, we, we essentially solved our own problem here. We don't even have to employ those pesky humans that demand pay <laughs> and that demand, uh, all these, these, uh, these Healthcare. ridiculous things <laughs> have a machine that can crunch the numbers and it'll produce us a script within a matter of seconds. Like easy peasy. That's uh that's, that's a pretty attractive prospect. And it just seems like it's getting closer and closer. We're perhaps not there yet, but that technology is only going to get more sophisticated as time goes on. Yeah. yeah. And it's really hard to regulate it too, because let's say for example, they outright banned it. And if any script was caught being chat GPT or whatever, then, uh, you know, you go to jail, even that extreme. Some guy can still have it type it up and then just read it off the screen and change the words and stuff. And then yep. you know, be like, well, this is my script. I wrote it. How are you going to check that kind of thing? It's really yeah. difficult. And, and and all the possible permutations of the, the AI that it can produce, like, how are you going to regulate that? Like, how are you going to know that it came from an AI? Like... You know, you, you can you can put you you can put a million different variables into it to change it ever so slightly. There's no way you're going to account for everything that could possibly go in and come out of this thing. And so, yeah, it just feels. <laughs> and you already have like, you um, oh shit, drink your right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, you were just lagging out. Um, I was going to say you already have us being like the the both the writers of like MOM and Quantumania we were like was this AI and this and they're like no, <laughs> well, I mean, She-Hulk like, yeah. uh, <laughs> she made the joke right that like Marvel stuff is created by a machine mm. which um, oh, yeah. that with uh with that Kevin robot yeah so, it's yeah. yeah and it's like when you're when you're making jokes about it. that and when you're openly acknowledging that this is a a criticism of your work like you're not gonna come back <laughs> from that like you're already saying like yep yeah, we know that like we're so fucking formulaic that people think we're we're written by machines. I think like, well, one of the best ways to prove though that they're not actually yet written by AI is that there are so many continuity errors, which AI probably would be better be at. Better at, yeah. <laughs> I think so, yeah. I, I think uh, no, yeah, maybe AI AI would be more competent than this. They have the AI write it, and then those writers put in plot holes to make it look more human made. <laughs> like. Fuck! This is too good. We're gonna, <laughs> gonna screw this a little bit. I was I was gonna ask uh, Baggage Claim. You made a video quite recently about uh, the the Marvels coming out and uh, and your your thoughts on that. Like, uh, are you excited for for the Marvels? Because we are. I mm -hmm. can tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna make Nerd excellent Rodic review saying, fodder. Yeah, yeah. Nerdrotic was like, it's gonna be Christmas. I'm I'm very <laughs> excited to see it. I I think it is going to be. You know, like when um captain marvel came out it was the you know it was the start of the end for for mcu and you know that's where everybody's like ears perked up like what's going on there's a lot of identity politics in this so i think this is going to be hopefully the creme de la creme of identity politics and us getting talked down to so i'm super excited to watch this <laughs> record. i can't wait I, I do think it'd be hilarious if somehow it turned out to be like the best movie they've ever put out. Like, I think <laughs> just a completely. I mean, so, I always hey, keep an open mind. Like, bro, why not? We'll see. Just completely subvert about. our expectations, but yeah, man, it's yeah. like the 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 character that nobody wants <laughs> or nobody's looking forward to. <laughs> Wonder how much money yeah, that film's gonna make. Oof. Oh, make. I'm curious, I mean, yeah. I think lose yeah. is probably the more operative term. Um, yeah, and I think because... they'll probably silently get her out of the contracts if they have any contract beyond this movie with her. I think because uh, it's weird, right? I, I tried to think back, like when the hell did the first movie come out? It was like 2019, 2019. so that's 2019. four years. 
Um, this is only her second movie that she's really had a significant presence in. And, you know, there was that interview that she did. I think it was, uh, you know, one of those showbiz things on the red carpet. It's like, uh, so um, you're going to be doing Captain Marvel after this? And, like, her response was like, I don't know. Does anyone want me to do it? Like, yeah, I, I, mean, I don't that know that what's going to happen. Uh... I think that was and that made me wonder. Yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, that's pretty strong indication of like she kind of knows that it's not a, not a popular character with longevity to her, and she probably just wants to get the hell out of it and do other stuff. I wouldn't blame her. Yeah, I'm sure there have been a lot of conversations with the up, upper level people at Marvel about her lack of, you know, her her decline in popularity because then they also tried a lot to rehabilitate her, and it's just not working. It is not working because when she's doing her own YouTube thing, fine, whatever, it's a tiny thing. But whenever she's out in front of people, she's just so unlikable. I, I think um, she's definitely because, you know, I'm not going to pretend I've seen every bloody interview that she's ever done or anything. But like I've seen the highlights and it's like, I don't know whether the eyes are on her. And so they're just looking for any slip up or whatever. But like, she seems to have just made a lot of these gaffes and the, these really awkward interviews where she just comes across as really prickly and kind of unlikable and, and kind of hostile to the, the interviewer or not getting along with her castmates. Yeah. Uh, and that sort of stuff stays in people's minds, you know? And I just think, damn, man, like part of being a celebrity at least amenable to the public you know you have to be kind of relaxed enough to to co you know converse with other people and just doesn't look like it at all like and she just gives the impression that she sits there and she reads all the bad press and just stews over it and then she goes in front of the camera and it all comes out or she's really restraining straining not to let it all come out she yeah she's not particularly personable at all no and it's unfortunate because it's like I, I want to, I don't know, I want to like keep an open mind on her and just say like, well, you maybe it's just unlucky or maybe like she's just like she's a super nice person, but she's uh, a bit socially awkward and it just comes across really badly when she does these interviews and maybe she just doesn't know how to do the, the whole press game. Um, but then it could just be that she's a total asshole, and like it's, <laughs> you never quite know. Like you're you're never gonna know exactly. But like I guess you have to just go on that track record of like, well, all these interviews that she's done, she just seems really un like unlikable and and kind of uh, unpleasant towards other people, and that's it's got to mean something, I guess. Like, yeah, it'd be redeemable yeah. though if her character weren't written in basically the same way. I mean, the character is also yeah. kind of mean, although the scriptwriters don't seem to realize it. I mean, she's not exactly the, the most nice and pleasant of the heroes on Alpha, um, which is one of the reasons nobody's really excited to see her back. She's one of the more ego-driven yeah. characters where the, their particular portrayal isn't aware of it. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. like Tony Stark, if he does anything ego-driven, characters call him out and he experiences consequences. Captain Marvel goes ego-driven and she's often rewarded and celebrated. It's like, yes, go, girl, oh, be ego-driven. It's ego a really awesome. irritating comment you always get. So you criticize her for stuff that Tony Stark does too. <laughs> yeah, but the, the script knows that he's being a dick. It yeah, doesn't think she is. Rely on it. And well, it punishes yeah. he knows that. that. Tony yeah. has that issue. That's, that's something he works on. Yeah. And but she I, doesn't I just... get yeah, she, she doesn't run into any of issues. But what you were saying, Drinker, about her, maybe she's just like this. Like maybe she's a nice person. And that the greatest video on her is the one that Charisma and Command did years ago. I think it's from, from 2019. It has like 13 million views on that, where it actually they actually compare her performance in 2019 in those interviews versus what she how she was performing years ago and years ago she was funny likable you know down to earth she was very good about being personable and that disappeared after she got um the captain marvel role and i think i think maybe the oscar contributed to it maybe it the her, oscar, yeah. you know her mm. foray into into the activism stuff contributed to it but she went from being happy and excited and open to now being very prickly and angry towards particular people. It became, it became in her mind, she divided her audience between people I like and people I loathe. And so it, it became this, it became this battle. Like I'm here to fight. I'm not here to be liked. I'm here to actually like, oh, you're going to tell me to smile. 
you know, F you, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to mess you up, you know, because I'm, I'm Captain Marvel. So it just, you no, know, who, who's going to like that? You know, it's, that's mm. not good enough. Well, I think, it, you know, if you can't get on and have a bit of chemistry with someone like Chris Hemsworth, like in an interview, there's got to be something wrong. Like that was really fucking awkward. Uh, I think my favorite yeah. one was like Jeremy Renner. <laughs> it's like yeah. the two of them are talking together and oh my God, that dude just looks like he wants to die. <laughs> like, He's I so wish done. I was anywhere but here. Um, so done. I mean, Don, yeah, I mean, Cheadle, Don Cheadle couldn't stand her. Dear God. I think with the, with the Marvels though, um, this is a movie that's got nothing to protect it now. You know, the Captain Marvel... As, as people have pointed out, you know, it was right at the heyday of the Marvel, uh, the MCU, you know, it, it almost had unstoppable momentum. So any movie that came out around about then was going to do extremely well. And now they don't have that. And I think it'll just be, it'll be very interesting to see um, like, what, five times now? I think it's five. Um, and, uh, and I've vanished. And yes. I'm back. And there you five go. times what? Sorry. Yeah, you're back. <laughs> yeah, that, that's uh, it's been it's been delayed. I think five different oh. times now um, from its original mm -hmm. release date. And uh, I thought for I, a second you said you watched the original Captain Marvel five times, and I was like, what? No, because I'm not <laughs> a masochist and I don't hate myself. <laughs> oh, <laughs> for sure. I've probably seen it like that. <laughs> I was <gonna> say. <laughs> um, uh, with the are Marvel you okay? Movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Never <laughs> gonna do that. Point. I think I think he's okay now. But it was you had to, it was some intensive therapy, wasn't it, Mola? What? No, I'm fine. Yeah, I don't know. What drink it though. <laughs> I mean, it's why I drink, you know. Uh, I think uh, with the Marvels in terms of box office, I feel like Guardians Three is going to tell us what the cap is when it comes to success for individual uh, Marvel films that aren't Spider Man. Um, I think that'll be, cause it's like one of the, you know, Ant-Man, I think at this point it's safe to say that film failed or like that film was a failure. It didn't mm -hmm. make 500 million, it had $200 million budget, probably lost money. I imagine that, uh, all of these Marvel films have a similar budget. Um, and I would imagine that Guardians 3, uh, has or had more hype for it than the Marvels is going to generate. Cause I don't know if anybody really even remembers the first film that much. So I think Guardians Three sets the bar probably for how much money it could possibly make. I, I think yeah. I this was going to bring me on to Guardians Three um, now. Baggage claim. I know you haven't seen it, and so uh, I'm very aware that like it's going to be a bit boring if you have to sit through us talking about it for an hour. Um, so I would, I would, I would want to give you the opportunity if you want to to drop out, <laughs> talk about a movie you haven't seen. <laughs> Uh, but it's totally good. up to you if you want to stay with us for a while that's more than more than fine um, i'll stay for a bit and then and then drop off if it's if i'm like oh, i'm not really adding any value no problem okay um well i guess this is this is a good opportunity for me to ask everyone um how did you find it because i've seen it today i have seen it today fringy seen it today and so is little platoon so i don't lara hasn't seen it unfortunately so she can't contribute anything um, but I guess it's just a bit of a round table overall assessment of the film. Well, who should go first? You, probably. So we'll go like clockwise or something. But wouldn't that be you? Uh, it's fine. No, I, I guess All I'm... Right, I can go first if you want. That's fine. It's 12 midnight order for the clocks too. That's fine. I agree. Okay, so disappointed. I'd actually <laughs> argue a little bit significantly. I was expecting this, if I'm completely honest, to be at least pretty good. Uh, if not great, and I got given something that I'm scratching around uh, if I'm getting real, real harsh, could be considered bad. Uh, I don't like to say it too, too, without a lot of arguments backing it, because <laughs> people were like, wow, seriously? But uh, unfortunately, yeah. Um, I think it's significantly worse than the first two, and um, it didn't do a hell of a lot of things I think it needed to do to round out the trilogy. I was unhappy. Okay. Fringy, what was your assessment? Uh, I was also disappointed because I also came into this with uh, higher expectations than I have for basically any other Marvel film in years. I think that the Guardians films are among the stronger 
uh, MCU entries, um, especially having rewatched them ahead of three. And I would just say that uh, it, Guardians 3 is a much messier film than the other two. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that that seeps through and not just plot, but also uh, potentially in terms of character. I'm still kind of working on it and figuring out how I feel about it. But yeah, I was uh, I was quite disappointed. Okay. Baggage claim, what did you think? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Hey, um, that looks great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Platoon, what did you think? Similar. Um, still trying to work some of it out. I'm actually probably going to have to watch it again because it, it, it has the J.J. Abrams effect of everything moving so quickly that it's kind of hard to grasp hold of anything. Um, my over, sort of the overarching feel was they had one story idea for one character in particular and everyone else was kind of just tacked on out of a sense of obligation. Um, yeah, it's quite formulaic. So the Guardians turn up, they shout at each other a bit, it gets serious, there's a comedic interlude, there's a popular music song, and then you just repeat that. Um, I, I think it will go down probably as, as kind of well received because to the extent I've spoken to anyone about it, that their question has been, yeah, but is it better than phase four? To which my response is, well, y y how interesting is that to answer? It's it's the lowest of low bars. You're not telling me anything about the film by saying that it's not as shit as Ant-Man. You can do a bit better than that. Um, <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, there were some nice moments, but it, it does also play on the heartstrings so overtly with its sort of cutesy creature feature dynamic that it, it is kind of offensive. It's so easy to play on those heartstrings. And it does it so hard that your heartstrings kind of snap. And then you realize that you, you're just watching a huge, bombastic CGI fest with minimal character work. And then the way they ended, they rounded off without any spoilers, um, they just rounded off kind of with a bit of a nothingness. And it was a, yeah, it was just kind of meh. Okay. Um, well, I guess I should go as well. Um, I guess if I was to rank this, I would say it's, uh, it's better than anything that Marvel have produced since Spider-Man No Way Home, mm -hmm. but it's probably the worst of the three Guardians movies. Um, as I think Moller said, it's... Uh, no, sorry, it's Fringy. Um, it was the most uh, messy of the movies. Mm. Um, I, I think the, the best aspects of it were the Rocket Raccoon flashbacks. Um, there was some genuine emotional uh, high points to that. Um, so at its best, it was quite heartbreaking stuff. Uh, and it, it, it hit pretty well. It went to some interestingly dark places. It was also weirdly insulated from the rest of the MCU. It felt like it was completely disconnected from everything else going on, which can only be a good thing at this point. Um, at its worst, it was frustrating as fuck and, and uh, so dumb so goofy, so laden with ridiculous slapstick comedy. Like, if you had pulled me out of this movie at the one hour mark and said, Drinker, what did you think of that? I would say, I fucking hate it. This movie was awful. It was so dumb, so stupid. Um, all this, this ridiculous, like, goofy stuff put into it. Hated it. The, the, the um, concluding hour kind of redeemed it a little bit. Um, if, I, if I had to liken it to something i'd say it's a bit like it's a bit like love and thunder um and, and not in the sense of quality right but it, it's like as much as love and thunder was taika waititi dialed up to 11 this movie is james gunn dialed up to 11 with all the good and bad that comes to that well sorry that comes with it there it's like a competition to see how many fucking licensed songs they could possibly cram into this fucking movie. Like, I get it, James. You really, really like music and you want to, like, fill every scene with as many, like, pop songs from the 80s as you possibly can. Great stuff, man. But, like, sometimes it kind of overshadows the action. It becomes a little bit of obnoxious almost. And, uh, yeah, great. It's great that you put your brother in so many scenes when you, you, you know... You probably don't need to, but like, yeah, he's your brother, so yeah. Okay, great. Um, but yeah, it, it's uh, it's it's a very uneven film, and it's at its best, it's really good. At its worst, it's terrible. It, um, it yeah. really fluctuates uh, all over the place. We're gonna try and remain spoiler free, right? As yes, best as we possible. Can. So, I'm I'm fifty fifty on whether this would even be counted as a spoiler. As said it in his review, and I think that it's fair to say it's almost a warning. But Adam Warlock fans, I don't think you're going to be happy. 
<laughs> I, uh, what was the fucking point of Warlock yeah. in this movie? Oh, there you go. That's what I, <laughs> like, I was going to yeah. say. What, what purpose does he... He seems like the most, like, oh, you got you got to have him in there. But I don't know how to fit him in the story. Well, figure it out. I, <laughs> I, I feel like you could have set him up as a really good antagonist. Oh, he could have been great. But... When, he, when you think about what he does in that first, oh, that first scene... It's like, okay, there could, you could set up rivalries with a bunch of different characters and have a great climactic battle with him and it would be a, an awesome emotional payoff. And there's nothing. Um, there's I'd nothing to him. That opening scene, drink it, it exemplifies possibly my primary issue with the entire plot rather than characters. Um, it, you know, if I was to section it out that way. Uh, I have no idea what the stakes are at any point with anyone's health bars or damage being delivered to anybody no. i never know you could have someone's head get blown off which <laughs> may happen in the <laughs> film and it may mean nothing at all it's uh... characters characters who are, who are ostensibly human or have the same amount of sort of resilience as a human body can get pushed like can get blasted through walls grabbed by someone and throw multiple walls made out of like steel or concrete uh and just be like ow that was painful and like no lasting effects to it it's baffling um the it's really the baffling of... ones is when people get shot with very significant energy weapons and the movie slows down and tragic music plays and then i fight. thought yeah i thought that that's a bold move what they're gonna kill this guy off in this scene really oh no they're not okay and then that yeah, happened two or three times the, the, the this movie teases a lot anymore. This movie teases a lot of deaths and doesn't really deliver. Yeah, I would go as far as saying the film is cowardly when it comes yep. to consequence. Yep. yep. And it's really annoying because I got tricked like a million times. I was like, okay, so I'm getting into the mood now that this is serious. This is no, no, they're fine. Oh, okay, sorry. I... Yeah, really, like, so many times before, it's just like, what? Okay, yeah, I don't. Yeah, all right, I don't believe you anymore. <laughs> like, I, oh, and dude. I'm trying, I'm trying to do this without spoiling the movie for people, so I'm trying to speak yeah. it as vaguely as I can. But mm. yeah, like, this is like the final movie in James Gunn's trilogy, and you kind of thought like, oh, he's gonna kill a few people off. This is a very final movie. This is a goodbye. And it just doesn't feel like it. It feels like they wimped out, and it's almost like the executive st stepped in and said, nah, we want to keep these people around in case we want to do other films in future. Definitely feels like an exec said, that Adam Warlock guy, you got to get him in because we're going to maybe do something more with him in the future. It sounds like an Age of Ultron type situation, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I, I think my, my favorite parts of the movie were Rocket's flashbacks. Mm -hmm. I think that that plot line was really well done, and I think it like it was more that you said it. It's like they had a great character arc for his character, and they didn't really know what to do with anyone else, and so there was I great payoffs. I think that was Platoon, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, Platoon. Apologies. Um, but yeah, like they they had some great payoffs there, um, some really big emotional um, you know hits because you know. We're not psychopaths here, so if we see animals getting uh, tortured and, and suffering and stuff, like we're all going to feel that emotional hit of seeing that. Um, and so it's almost like calculated to tug at the heartstrings. So, um, to push it up a bit, because I don't want this to be too much of a shit show. And in terms of, like, we've all pretty much agreed, I think, that it's much better than a lot of the stuff you get in Phase 4. Um, yes. I really liked, for example, Rocket has been mentioned. I really liked Nebula in the film. I really liked uh, the villain. For the most part, I'm not. The gonna, villain was it's great I, because the, the decisions that get made by different people at different times that can affect how much I enjoy them overall. But I'd still say it was it's probably the best villain in Phase Four. Like, I I, I liked. He, he's a good of, mad. He's a good mad scientist, and I feel like he really is. Probably a lot of it has come down to the performance of the actor. I thought he did a great job. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, I I really he's bought into this like the fact that he's emotionally invested in the thing that he's doing. That I appreciated. Uh, he's I not wasn't just so like sure. I mean, it might be that I missed this bit. So I thought he was incredibly well performed. Um, he had some. He had some kind of startlingly good lines, and it's a compelling motive. Except that I wasn't really sure why. And it might be that I just wasn't paying attention, or I was too busy focusing on something else while that was happening. Is it? I mean, we can't spoil it. But am I right in thinking that they don't ever really answer the why question of what he's doing? Um, I think <laughs> that. I think it's something that can be inferred in terms of a thematic element, but the problem is that I think the them thematic element is um, muddled. Mm. Um, 
I'm not sure if I want to even say what the thematic element is because, well, hmm, uh, yeah, I might hold off on that. I uh, something that <laughs> I found with uh, the high Dude. evolution areas, there's almost like a clash between the way that he's characterized, how his plan manifests in terms of like what it looks like in the plot and how it's all managed, and then like trying to pair it with a theme that could be derived from the film. So it's kind of complicated, but I'm I'm like erring on the side of I like him, yeah. I like him, um, like as a villain, um, and definitely a little bit know, retarded. The, the, <laughs> yeah. The, the, see, for for people watching this, like who haven't seen the movie, there's one of the central um, ideas that the film wants to explore is like if you try to fix society with theoretically the perfect people put into it. Um, what do you do when uh, like the same problems that beset our society eventually rear their heads? You know, and that that feels like something that should take up an entire movie by itself. Like that's a big theme to address, and it's just like one tiny facet of this film, and so it doesn't get anywhere near enough attention that it deserves. Absolutely undercooked. Yeah. Because uh, it's uh the most like the most robust developed aspect of this film is like Rocket. Um and and then and his is like directly you know tied into to all of that but then because it's like well we still need to do stuff for everybody else right we still need to be because you know guardians of the galaxy it's not rocket raccoon um and then it struggles in that regard to balance it even though it is longer than the other two films like the first film was surprisingly um uh swift in terms of what it's achieving it's two hours long um and in that time it completely develops that core set of characters um so that we understand them clearly they all get sent on arcs that are resolved in that film and then you know they grow as a team um this one struggles more possibly because it has so many characters um it, it, it's trying to do so many things and it's trying to grapple with so many um so many big ideas and there's mm-hmm. just not enough time to do it and it the, the frustrating thing is it wastes so much fucking time on stupid stuff Mm-hmm. Like there's a there's yeah. a real yeah. there's a real element of busy work to that first hour where yeah. it's like they they rocket gets injured and they have to find a fucking code to so that they can do an operation on him so they go to the the place and they infiltrate and there's a big long sequence where the the production design is like off the wall insane um, but then they they do all that stuff and then they find out that the one piece of crucial information that they need has been taken and it's been put into the head of another guy that they have to go and get and so mm-hmm. it was completely pointless it was just it was like a Mandalorian plot just wasting <laughs> time just busy work to keep us invested in something yeah there should have been uh, it, way more character development interactions in those sequences to make them worthwhile but it really felt like the big focus is on look how interesting this idea is it's like a huge building that's constructed of flesh instead of I, mechanics i hate i i can't emphasize enough how much i despise that entire sequence it, i it hate how like, stupid um, it is i hate how stupid everyone is in it it's like it came from a completely different movie uh and it's it's wait, like a building made out of flesh yeah, it's like so a living. It, yeah, so ima- imagine you want to. Yeah, so imagine you want to build a space station instead of building it out of steel and, and whatever. Like they just grow it as biomechanical, and so like they they land on it and it's like being on someone's skin where there's like pores and hair and stuff sticking out of it. It's, they have to cut um, their way in. It's all creeps. just Ugh. it's all just done for comedy. And like the the guards that they have to fight against have got these ridiculous big like Michelin Man space suits. Yeah, they're clearly it's all designed <laughs> to make us like laugh at it. And the thing about yeah. it is like this is a problem James Gunn has. And I'm trying to be nice, okay? But the example I will have to give is Taserface from Guardians of the Galaxy Two, where mm. James Gunn thinks his joke is way funnier than anyone else does. It's like man. You need to, like, find someone to tell you. It's basically, there's a bad guy soldier man who's like, my epic awesome name, all of us badass ravages, my name is going to be Taser Face. And they're all like, yeah, whoa, cool. And then Rocket starts laughing at him, saying how stupid and ridiculous that name is. And the joke not only goes on for about, I want to say, like, three or four minutes in that sequence, it gets repeated about four times throughout the film. And it's like... What is the joke that a guy was stupid enough to take Taser Face as a cool name? It's like that might get you a smile, but like, dude, just come on, move on. The, 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 yeah. The, the, yeah, there's, there's, there's so much of that, and like, I think one of you guys mentioned it already. Like, the the way they handle character conflict is to to basically have everyone yelling at each other all the time. Oh like, it's not, and, and it's they're doing not their bits interesting. As well. 
So it's not even like that they're yelling particularly new information that drives characters along. It's just, well, we know what Drax is. Drax does this thing. So let's have him do this because that's Drax. It's like, okay, we do know that. We've had several films of that. Um, and, and maybe it would be nice to do that in a way that drives character a bit more than you're doing. It feels like a greatest hits compilation for a, a, lot, a lot of it. It's like everyone remembers this about Drax. Everyone remembers this about Mantis. So that, let's just bring that happy memory back and do the same thing Actually, again and again and again. I think you're on point with that. There's a bit of flanderization going on because uh, someone might argue, like, a lot of these things are in the first one, so why does that get away with it, but this doesn't? And Because I was just thinking about even their approach to solving problems, it's very ragtag, rogue, and just let's just go with it. We'll do it and just see what happens. There's a great moment in the film, and I mean great in a bad way, where, I can say this, not much for spoiler, a character basically jumps out a window to their death, and they don't have a plan. They just yeah. do it. That's their plan. Yeah. They're just going to jump out and something will happen. Something will work out. And the thing about it is, like, it annoys me that as a team, they've been going for this long. They have this kind of tech. They have monetary support. They've, they just they know everything they've, they've been doing. They've done loads of missions. First movie, they've just been thrown together. And a lot of the situations are very much just, fuck, we're in this now. What do we do? What do we do now? Oh, it's very reactive. But they, even in the third movie, presumably their 100th mission, they still operate that way, even when they have information, and it's kind of like annoying, because um, I feel like they deserve to be written smarter, but a lot of the time they're just like, fuck it, let's just go over here and try this. I think you even have like meta lines about it, it's like, you know, uh, don't you realize that place is the place where blah 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 is, and we can't just blah blah blah, and then Star Lord is like, yeah we can. It's like, okay. Well, yeah, well, like... <sighs> The, the, Combined the, the, with uh, them forgetting about technology and, and material, like they, they forget about tools that they have at their disposal that change the film if they use them. So that's pretty annoying. Uh, and, it, you know, yeah. There, there's a lot of like supposedly impregnable like space stations and stuff that like nobody can get into that they just like breeze in. Like any like the 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 four of us, sorry, the five of us could probably come up with an idea to get into these places. It's so simplistic. And everyone who works there is so ridiculously incompetent that it happens again and again. You've got gigantic space stations that that should that, that house like the most vital stuff to the 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 villains' um, master plan, but they've got no defenses. They've got nothing to protect them. They've got uh, yeah, no way of fending off alien warships. All that stuff. It's just it's so dumb and it's so like it just feels like it was all. Very much just contrived for this one particular. Put the movie. In. Yeah, man, it's just there's so much of that throughout um, I this think, film. Um, it uh, it reminds me of so the Suicide Squad is a film that like in terms of plot, it's kind of a disaster, but like um, character is is a is a really really saves that film, and I feel like um, this film suffers from a lot of the same problems in terms of like really really jank plotting. Um, and the concern that I have is that the more I think about it, the more I think that those plot problems are going to seep into character. That's what's concerning me at the moment as I'm thinking about I, the film. Well, I, put it put it in this way: like I didn't particularly like Nebula in this film. I, I felt like she didn't really act like herself. She she was very um, the the old Nebula was kind of quite logical and very calculated about things. This one just seemed like very angry all the time, and it just didn't fit with her as well as as previous incarnations. Finally, um, we can disagree on something. <laughs> fair enough. Uh, and Gamora, like, just annoyed the hell out of me uh, uh, because there was there's so many scenes where uh, I was just waiting for Peter to to bite back a little bit. Like, there's one particular scene where, like, she's, like, uh, ranting and ranting at him and pushing him constantly, saying, like, I just want to be picked up by the Ravagers and I want to be taken out of this. And, you know, I mission, there's no chance of success. I, I, I'm not want to be part of this. You have to get me out of here. And that would have been an ideal moment for Peter to just be like, fuck you. Rocket is our friend. He means the world to me. And, like, I'm going to risk everything to get him back or I'm going to save him or whatever. Like that that's a moment where he needed to stand up for himself, but he wasn't allowed to fucking do it. He just like takes it and it had to be Nebula who like protects him and stands up for him. And it just felt so fucking irritating. The, the, there was things like that just throughout the movie that that were just pissing me off about her. So I I'm actually not... 
Oh, I think over. that Gamora is off character wise. I don't think I'd, I'd love to talk to James Gunn about it. I'd be like, why did you think from 2014, right, Guardians of the Galaxy, the girl who basically was the one that convinced the Guardians to do the moral thing, the one that worked with the Nova Corps, the one that left Thanos the moment she realized like the Earth is in trouble or the, the universe is in trouble. Why would that girl team up with the Ravages? I don't understand. And then yeah. why is she such an asshole? Like he, James Gunn's clearly running with like she's she's punished Gamora. It's like, but why? Why did you yeah. make her punish Gamora? She, she, I don't know, man. Like if Peter's coming to her and saying like, look, I know you don't know me, but like in the future, like the Gamora that I knew, like we fell in love, we had this incredible relationship and stuff. Would she not at least hear out? Like you say, based on the Gamora that we know, and it's the same person, it's the same baseline personality, she'd be at least open to listening to him. But it's like oh. her her entire shtick is like, what? Well, no, we have to press the reset button on their relationship, and she just has to be a dick to him at all times. Some people don't understand. So I'm not talking about us ke keeping the personality traits of the Gamora that went through Guardians 1, Guardians 2, Endgame, blah, blah, blah. I'm talking about the, the Gamora we meet in Guardians 1 is the Gamora in this movie plus however many years. Why yeah. would the one that left Thanos, which by the way, when they snatched that Gamora from in Endgame, if you remember, that's the 2014 Gamora. It's, it's not too long before Guardians. In fact, I think it's like around about the same time because they're doing the, they, they're stopping Peter from getting the power stone at the same time. So it's, it, it's set right around Guardians. Why would that Gamora join the Ravages? I don't understand. Well, like, why is that Gamora such an asshole? Well, just think, about, uh, think about the characterization of that Gamora in Endgame, like with the scenes that she had with Nebula, like that confrontation and how she was trying to talk yeah. her out of, you know, to, to do the, it, it's like that confused, Gamora is standoffish, um, but she has that moral core that is driving her in, in the first film. It, it's, the, it's the core that like enables the team to come together, like you said. It's like, it's, it's almost like he's kind of forgotten like who she was. Or has like made a mistake in terms of assessing that character and where she ought to be. Um, it, it's because it's it's a similar. Loki is really frustrating. That show is really frustrating because they forgot that they plucked Loki out at his most yeah. evil, and then they're like, "Well, if we show him a video, we, we can just fast track him to be the Loki that we want him to be." Um, it's like a different problem here, um, of almost like a, a, a another misread of like who that character was at that time. And yeah, so it just, it just doesn't, it didn't read properly to me. And the, he kind of puts her, not necessarily on an arc, but in this film, she is broken down a little bit. By the time you get to the end, she's much more of a, closer to the Gamora we're familiar with. But I just don't see how, how that happened. I don't know why he went with that. It felt almost um, like a stereotype. Like, yep. this one's going to be angry and an asshole. And that'll, that'll uh, create a very significant sort of difference in the relationship. And it's like, yeah, I know, but you have to justify it. I, I think as well as with, if with they're written by AI. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think with Nebula as well. Like I know Moller, you disagree with me on this one, but uh, I always just I saw Nebula as being like the um, the the kind of dry humored, uh, very cool, um, calculated sort of character. There was an undertone mm -hmm. of like anger and resentment to her certainly, but uh, I always felt like she would have more of a witty retort. But in this one, it's like she's just yelling at people all the time. Um, I am, and I, I, it just doesn't feel like Nebula as I knew her. So, um, famous? No, not famous. Infamously, a, a word. Uh, Endgame <laughs> is a film where I've basically gotten to the point uh, in conjunction with discussions over the years of thinking Endgame was a complete disaster, almost. And it's like, why'd you say oh. almost? It's like, well, I liked Black Widow's contribution to the film, her through line in that. I thought that was good, and I think I'm okay with Nebula's. Uh, she was like the, they were like the only two characters I thought were not completely damaged Asterisk, by it. Asterisk, though, to throw in there is a bad decision that Nebula makes in that film that facilitates the yes, entire yes, third act. Yes. I, don't, I don't know if anyone's made it out in that because of the decisions they make as a group anyway. Like, Black Widow was uh, a part of the... So, you know, it, it's still a bit of a mess. But um, Nebula, I've really enjoyed... She, like, sneaks up on me in the MCU as being someone I actually really, really like. And uh, Well, I, I did like her and, until this movie. <laughs> like, I really so, like Nebula. Uh, I think they properly justified her fury in this film, and I kind of... I'm on board with it. She's, like, the only character who doesn't fuck around, and she's annoyed, and there's that scene where she blows up at um, Drax and Mantis for fucking around. And I'm trying not to spoil anything, but 
she basically talks about how the team is constructed of people that maybe shouldn't be there. And I, I was, I found that that's probably my, might be my favorite scene in the movie. I, I was very satisfied by that finally getting addressed, um, because it's, you know, there's, there's references. Well, it does made. follow, it does follow a pretty, some, some baffling character decisions, uh, from certain, from yeah, certain characters. That yeah, facilitate um, the entire third one, act again. The one thing I would concede, Drinker, that you're correct on is that for some reason, I guess for the joke or for the compar uh, the contrast with Drax. They make her shout at children. I was just like, what are you doing? Like, Nebula's not that stupid. She knows how children work. She wouldn't just go, because the whole point is for them her to back off and Drax to bring in his fatherly yeah. qualities. And it's like, yeah, you didn't you didn't need to be so overt. Not more, you need to concede to more of my points. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about it, because I'm trying a little here to, to talk about things I did like in it, because I didn't hate the movie. I just... I'm just so disappointed that it is overshadowing my um my the things I want to talk about, you know. I mean, if we were to um you know if we were to focus for a moment on the things you really did like about it, what would be your picks? You know, that what scene did you... where Rocket is really connecting with his friends in his flashback, and they all talk about their names. I thought that was just basically perfect. And the funny thing is, that's already someone you can see online now. They released it ahead of the movie. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, <sighs> yeah. Well, it was just really, problem. really. I felt like it was completely genuine, like authentic, as these little creatures talking about how much they'd like to be free someday, see the sky, and what names they choose for themselves. Just, mm -hmm. just for your point of view, baggage claim. Um, like Rocket Raccoon is obviously like an animal that's been taken and experimented on and stuff, and like taken from his base origin and then turned into something like far more intelligent. And so he backs in the movie. You get to see other animals that have gone through similar experiments and stuff, like. Um, it's a little bit like the the scene from Toy Story with Sid's toys, where they've all been like mutilated and turned into like horrible different things and stuff. But like they're still, um, I guess you would call it like innocent animals underneath it all. And so they yeah, got very it's more you know, manipulative even than the Toy Story one is. And that's the only thing that I brush up against for that scene because I agree that that's sort of dramatically it's really well done. Um, but I, I find myself really wanting to resist falling for that because it's it's a <laughs> you shortcut. You cynical it's, son of a stop. bitch. <laughs> it's a shortcut. Like how, how do I drum up the audience's emotion? Let's torture some cute I animals. It, no, don't kick the bunny oh, rabbit. The bunny matter. rabbit's it cute. Could have like, been, they could have been goblin people, and I'd still have felt a lot in that scene. It doesn't matter I mean, they're I, a cute I, bunny. I'll, I'll tell you the scene. I, I think you know the one I'm talking about, but like when something bad happens in those flashbacks... Um, and you get to see Rocket's reaction to it. Wow, yeah. like that mm -hmm. was uh, that was a heavy moment. Um, I mean, he's he's the best character in the film. And I thought the problem is, it's like it's hard to really delve into exactly why without getting into spoilers. Um, yeah, Bradley I mean, Cooper I, I, does a great job, no matter if it's I voice think, or real acting. That that performance more... there, like vocal performance, like I assume maybe it was mocap as well, but like, yeah, I'll be sure that, that was that. yeah, yeah, that that it's, was it's, uh, um, that was tough. It's uh, Rocket. It, it, he's he, he's one of my actually. I, I think he is one of my favorite characters in like the MCU. He's just had a lot of uh, great stuff, and like I feel like Infinity War and Endgame. He's like an instance of a character who gets out of all of that in a, a better place, uh, rather than what I think happens with a lot of other characters, like Thor, for instance, like deteriorating. Um, and there's some like really great payoffs for that character in this film. Um, I though I I think I would say I <laughs> as much as he was like the main focus I think I wanted more uh and specifically uh no I can't say <laughs> can't say really without uh spoiling it um I, yeah I I, I, I wish he wasn't unconscious for most of the movie I'll put Oh it well way. I mean if we yeah so if we say that yeah I want more interplay with him and the guardians because it's actually been a long time since we've had a lot of interplay with him and the guardians in the first film we got a lot of it and two he was separated and it was with Yondu Infinity War yeah. was a lot of it with Thor mm. and in Endgame a lot of it was with Thor and the other Avengers we haven't had much interplay with Rocket and the other guardians for a long time at this point um, I'll just say it, like, um, up until this movie, I never really cared that much about Rocket. I, I oh, found him okay. just... Not that I didn't dislike him, I just thought, you know, he's just kind of a goofy character, and he's, like, a bit abrasive in terms of his personality, and there's just not... There's not a whole lot there. There's not a whole lot to him. Uh, there was hints that he had this, like, traumatic backstory, but the, the, the movies never really expanded upon it until now. 
Um, and so I was just never that invested in him. And it was only this movie that really, um, wow, really brought it to the fore well, and really made me appreciate him. What I would say to probably, I, I understand where you're coming from with that, because I think that this film recontextualizes a lot of uh, a lot of the way that he interacted with people in the prior films. Because mm. like, it's something, you get an undercurrent of like discontent with Rocket and like a desire to push people away and maintain some distance, um, like in those first two films. And now it's like, oh, yeah, I understand where that comes from because I understand what happened to you in your past. Um, I know where that comes from now and I know why that informs your character and I know why you're so standoffish on being called a raccoon, you know? Like, I even know why that's the case. And then there's a specific payoff that's that's really satisfying uh, based on that mm. because of because of all of the uh, that, that sort of underlying sense of trauma that you get in the earlier films. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought that the, if anything, oh, it's really hard to do this without spoiling it. But <laughs> did anyone else find that the, the, the end sort of worked against his entire plot line, though? I mean, you have essentially the, the theme of his sort of triumph is that the reclamation of, of family, and then you get the end, and it's like, well, you, but not uh, really. I know what you mean. Um, I think there's, it's a like... unpack. there's a lot to unpack with that. Yeah, it's it goes, the meta it's... intruding upon the themes of mm. thing. So a common complaint I've seen, and again, we can remain spoiler-free, is that the ending is too long, that it takes a while to wrap up everything. I don't have that complaint whatsoever. I'm just not a fan of the choices for a lot of characters. I feel like they're arbitrary as hell. Mm -hmm. yes. Some characters just yeah. be like, I'm going to do this. And you're like, why would you do that? <laughs> that the, like, what? And it's just like, yep, that's happening now. And you're like, okay, all right then, I guess. And uh, the ending feels like James Gunn was told, like, however you do your movie, this is how it ends, because these are where these characters are going next uh, yep. without you. Yeah. It's like, um, yeah, it, it, it almost as if he had an ending and they're like, well, we have some notes. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we have some notes. Yeah. And to... it's, it's like, yeah, like, as long as it ends up at this place that we need it to with these characters, you can do what you want in between. And so it kind of goes back to my point I made earlier of like, this just feels like all the James Gunness has been like dialed up to 11. And like all of his traits as a, a filmmaker are just like over the top crazy in this film. Well, mm. on that note, how do we feel about the comedy in this film? Hit and fucking miss. hate it. <laughs> I hate I, yeah. it because most of the jokes don't fucking land and they're so tonally mismatched with like the really heavy serious very, stuff that like underpins dude, it all. I'm almost at the point of having PTSD. Whenever something serious is happening, I'm like, please, please, please don't. Don't do a joke. Don't, 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 don't. And then it'll like cut to Drax and they'll be like, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's kind of what he's at now, right? He's he Yeah, flanderization is a good way to describe Drax, I'd say. I, I think the balance the balance was stronger in like one and two in terms of comedy and drama. One it especially, suffers, it yeah, suffers but... for its own success. I think though, um, it's it suffers for its own success because it was successful, and so James Gunn thinks well, repetition is is obviously just the key to maintaining that. It also suffers because what was new at the time, generally in the MCU, is now saturating the MCU. Like we're so used to seeing emotional rubber banding, serious moment ended by joke, um, that. It doesn't have the shock value that it maybe did in Guardians 1. Lots of people point to Thor Ragnarok as sort of the origin of the MCU's tonal mm. shift. I think Guardians is probably the better example. It worked in Guardians 1, but then everyone else did it, and James Gunn didn't develop it. And then, as a result, he's playing his greatest hits in this, Flanderization, as you say. Um, and it's it, it's it's gotten old now. I don't think it has the same currency. We're not as forgiving of it either as I think we might have been were this not the umpteenth instance of it. Um... I th yeah, I, I I think um I think that's part of it, but I think something I'd say I don't know if the the jokes are they, I don't think they're as clever or as uh yeah, as they were too. before, and I think because I I found the Suicide Squad really funny um most of the time, and this film was yeah it was just more hit and miss. There were jokes where it's like oh yeah, and then there were a lot of jokes where it was just kind of stone faced like oh damn oops like that <laughs> swing and a miss you know. I um for because like I feel like it's relatively spoiler free, but in order to um get past a certain checkpoint, um, uh, Mantis has the security guard feel love for Drax. Therefore, that bias will allow them to get past him, and she's also doing it to annoy Drax because they're having a bit of a relationship thing. Which again, I could form criticism of that alone, but I won't mm -hmm. for the sake of saying that I quite I like I end when when the guy's like, hey. 
what's your name? And then Drax just like it'll tighten up on him. You'll go Drax the Destroyer, like <laughs> like very uncomfortably saying Destroyer. Just like oh, this fun I'm having. I might smirk, but then if you keep the joke going and going and going and repeat, or there's some jokes that just um, I don't even understand. Like like you know like Drax, haha. Drax will lie on a settee instead of sitting on it, and we're gonna do that joke three times. I don't like. It's like I, the. I it's, was it that it's like funny the, that you needed to do that. It, it's like the when they make entry to that like biomechanical space station is like Drax has to fit through the narrow gap that they've cut, and then they have to hide their spacesuits, and then they float out into space, and then they're arguing about like what to do about it because they've lost their suits to get away from it. It's just. It's not that funny to begin with, and I, again, you just don't. <laughs> Drinker, we can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? We we got to. It's not that funny to begin with, and then you cut out. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm just talking about like the like the segment where they um they have to like hack their way into that biomechanical spaceship. Like they cut their way through, and Drax can't fit through the hole, and then they have to like stow their spacesuits in like a the storage bin um I, you get interrupted by this the goofy security guards who have to make a joke about like how one of them's annoying and he's like it's, I've it's, got it's one just, of those two and yeah it just yeah, oh, goes on for well. so fucking long and none of it like none of it's that funny to begin with that it can be There's, spun and, out for this long that's kind of what i meant about because like this character stuff i like but the plot the more as i think free image the more to be thought about it the more you're like basically like they break into this place and then the security guards are called to that area because there's like an anomaly in the security or whatever they arrive and then you have like star lord just aggressively being like you guys took too long this is a test or we're running something blah 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 and then you know nathan villian who's the leader of the security in that area is like huh and it's that trope where playing it off as confident enough in you know special uniform might convince someone but i was like but you're in like a super high tech thing like, can't you just check can't you just go like are these guys supposed to be here with the command center and then that's it because it's like another... someone it's, it, yeah it's like they break into this room right there's like a security uh, alarm goes off like someone's someone's broken into this airlock because there's like we've lost atmosphere there or whatever uh i'm going to bring up a, a security camera to look and see what's happened and like someone just slaps this magical bullshit device on the security camera that makes it blank <laughs> out. Like I don't know yeah. if that was me, that would be a very strong indication that someone was trying to break into my highly secured facility. Well, you, you've you've already nailed it. If they had talked to command, command would be like, "So my camera's reading that no one's in that room," and then they'd be like, "Oh, but there is." And then you'd be like, "Huh, that's weird. Look at the camera. Is it functioning?" You'd be like, "Oh, there's some device on it blocking it. Is this you guys? You know what I mean?" And, and yeah, I was like. Well it's, it's there's the another character performing for the audience in that case rather than acting like real people in that situation yeah it's so lazy um another example would be when they're trying to get into something that's super secure for very significant plot reasons and they're like uh they scan star lord he's got no weapons you can come on nebula you can't because you are a living weapon and it's like okay but groot can come <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> Groot's Groot more of a living weapon, weapon than any of them. Yeah, and, and just for for a little bit of context as well, like uh, it's like they just came up with like a, an idea of like, wouldn't it be funny if? And so, like in this case, it'd be like, wouldn't it be funny if they were on planet Earth, but planet Earth was inhabited by like fucking extras from the island of Doctor Moreau? Yeah, but like the the culture, the houses, the technology levels were all the same as like you know Earth in the present day, and that's what you see. And it's done just purely because it's a visual gag. It's funny to see animals walking, like fucking pigs walking like baby pigs along like the the sidewalk, and 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 it's like this idealized nineteen fifties like view of of uh, like suburbia. But it's like they they don't think beyond that. There's no like indication of why any of this was picked. Like why pick Earth out of all the billions of planets in the the, the Earth universe? Earth is the most like, important place in the Marvel universe. In the MCU, apparently, anyway. it is. Yeah. But I guess that, that was the that was the why question I was bringing up earlier because the reason given in the film is that he went there once and he liked some of it but he thought it's a bit of a shame about the people so we can do it better. No, I mean it's this it's my attitude to France and London, but I don't then go and. Um, you know, destroy the entirety of a species in order to try and perfect it. But th that's the why question, which is that why, why Earth? Is that just because it looks familiar, I, I guess? And the excuse is that, well, he visited once, which is not much of a reason. 
And we can have the visual gag of like our characters with their spaceship, you know, interacting with with present day Earth houses and cars and technology and stuff. And it just it's going to look funny. It's going to look weird from this point of view. That 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 seems to be the thinking behind it. Um, and again, like it, the point that I made earlier, um, the the villain of this movie has tried to create the perfect society where he's genetically engineered everyone who's going to inhabit this planet uh, so that they have um, no inherent aggression. They're going to be like really uh, pacifist and docile and productive. And he's going to create the perfect society. And yet it still falls victim to crime and drug abuse and all the, all the ills that plague us now. Um, that in itself is like a lot to try and unpack in a story like thematically it's a lot you have to deal with but like the movie just doesn't take any time over it it's just a thing goes solution is just fuck it we'll just destroy the entire planet and start again i don't care well and then he has that um, slightly conflicting motive which is that he also prizes ingenuity and the ability to invent which is missing from that docile population and if, if you were interested in sort of unpicking that thematically you can say well what is the price of invention? It's invention or orthodoxy. You can't have both. Yeah. But the film doesn't even try, really, I don't think, to marry those two concepts. It's just that that was his original goal. It didn't really work. So here's his new one. And he's not linking those two things at all. No. If we, but they're almost there, right? Like, it's like, it's almost, it's just, you know, like, it's close to, to turning it into something that's a lot better. Like, it needs it's tweaks close, rather but, than... But yeah. it need, that needs to be the, the thematic focal point of the movie, but it's not. Yeah, it's I just agree. one tiny little facet. And yeah, I mean, I, again, I don't. I didn't feel any sense of loss for any of these people because I I didn't get to see enough of them to even care about them. You know, they're I, just I, they're just things on screen that I'm meant to care about because I've seen it for like you know five minutes and then we're moving on to the next thing and you're not meant to think about it too much. Can that, we that's... talk about? Is it a spoiler, or can we talk about the um, the sort of resolution of, let's say, the hero's response to the villain's point of view? Like what the what this film has to say on the topic of uh, I was just trying to perfect the world. No, <laughs> that's the perfect that's... answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, we I did. mean, I, 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 in the sense that, like, we could talk about it. I just don't know if there's no. much to say because there's nothing to grapple with here. Well, so there's no, there's no moral that. balance that we have to, like, you know, is one side more correct than the other or whatever. It's just like bad that's guy does bad things. Was, if we watched a movie where a villain was like, "We need to kill everyone who's ever committed a crime or something," and then the response from the heroes is, "No, we shouldn't." It's kind of like okay, <laughs> like, that's. Uh... <laughs> I don't know. I feel, I feel like there was a hell of a lot that was not talked about. Uh, they, 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 they go were... for the, the yeah, because you could, if this was handled better, right, you could paint the villain as like a Thanos type character who's like, okay, I've got a higher goal here and I have to do some bad things in order to get there. But like, and I regret that, but it's necessary. Okay. In this case, though, it's like, I'm just a fucking evil guy who likes to play God and I torture animals and stuff and experiment on them. Uh, to further my goals and i i want you to feel i want you to feel real relish when i get my comeuppance that's that's kind of where the movie goes there's no real delving into deeper ideas about what his motivations like, are that's almost part of the problem because it seemed like he was receptive to arguments in the same way that by the way that i felt like this was a um, almost lacking in infinity war it's like Man, we could have gotten so much more arguments between different characters and Thanos. They did give us Doctor Strange and Thanos, and a bit of Gamora and Thanos, which is why I was like, I was thankful for that. But I wanted way more. And this film, I feel like we didn't get much at all, like in terms well, of people challenging his point of view. Because a, a, a point, of, a thing that's worth challenged is like, well, how do you fit into all of this? You know, like you're the, you know, you're not the product of your own methodology necessarily. Like, how do you? But that I don't feel like that question really got explored much either. No, and I felt like we settled for, um, it's like, you know, you know, you have him at one point referring to Ro Rocket as an abomination. And I feel like the film was like, who do you think's the real abomination audience? Who who do you think? And yeah. you're like, I get it. I know. <laughs> but it, it's just, yeah, it's, it, it's this movie trying to do too many things with too many characters and not having enough time to really address anything. And it doesn't, it doesn't know what it wants to focus on. 
but you can you almost know, remove it, it seems like uh you could fix it by removing like a, a big portion of the movie specifically the the, the prison uh or not yep. the, the facility the living like that i don't know that you needed that really like mm -hmm. it, you needed it in the way that it was written now but it feels like it would take minor tweaks to circumvent that completely uh and then give yourself a whole bunch more time for character yeah you could have done much more you could have done much more productive things with that like 30 40 minutes yeah, that it takes to do that whole segment i guess mm -hmm. that's the the problem um and i don't know what the thinking was behind doing that it's just like well we've got the, the these really off the wall um settings and and you know creature designs and stuff that we want to use so fuck it we're just going to shove it in there why not i mean i think that might be the thinking it was mentioned before with the uh with uh counter earth of um there's a an idea like a visual that is interesting and you know figuring out a way to make it work and fit into the story is a bit harder but it's like it's almost like they thought yeah no we we did it we we made it work where it's just like uh you know <laughs> it's, it's, yeah it's, it's like james gunn was walking through the production office one day and like someone had just come up with some crazy concept art and he was like that's fucking awesome let's just mm. do that like how are we going to fit that into the film don't know like i just want to see it and was, we'll think um, of something to justify it later. Was Guardians 3 always going to be the last one? Or no, do you think that there's uh, two films that have effectively been crammed together for this one? If I, as I understand it, originally the plan was that James Gunn was going to be in charge of the cosmic side of Marvel. That was like yes. what he was going to be doing. Uh, and then he got fired and then, you know, he did the Suicide Squad, now he's going to DC. So I can, it, it seems like there would have been more Guardians films than this. This is the end because he's done with Marvel. But it's kind of not the end. <laughs> but just, just because, yeah. like, if anyone's gone into this thinking, like, "Wow, this is going to give us a real like swan song for the Guardians," and like people are going to die, and you know, it's really final. This is the last chapter of their story. It's kind of not. Like, I get the feeling if they really wanted to, they could pull everyone back together again and give all the actors hefty paychecks, and it'd be all fine. Writers reign. You know that that seems to be the logic there. So, well, letting things end it because um, my hope partially for the film was based on the sense that this could be an ending for a series that is just does not want to end. It, it doesn't want to end. It never wants to close the door. There's always potential for more films, you know, more TV shows, more projects. Hopefully, this one will be like a definitive ending. And I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't feel like it is a definitive yep we're, we're done with the guardians uh, and and we we really yeah. wrapped everything up in a neat little bow it's like not really no um no i don't feel that way well you, you it, have it, the it, promise made after the second post credit scene which guarantees <laughs> that uh, it's not it's not quite finished <laughs> yeah. yet yeah but no also, one's ever really no one's like ever really the, gone the ending was put I upon it that it's only in meta that we consider this the end of the trilogy the end of the story of the guardians of the galaxy it's not really it's not even close mm -hmm. I mean, they, how do you guys they, like, think it's gonna do then on the box office? I know, I don't know. none, That's a none tough of you one. really loved Ooh. it. Yeah. I, I, don't know. If, if this had if this had been like three years ago or four years ago, I would say it would be doing a billion easily. Um, now, with the way that Marvel is, uh, I think probably seven hundred million would be a good number for this. I think um, my struggle. I don't know how the general audience reacts to this film. Like, I'm not. I don't I don't know I don't know if I get a clear read on whether people will love it, find it middling or dislike it. And I don't know how well it will be remembered. I'm, uh, I don't know I'm not what, sure what kind of word of mouth this will get. I really don't. Mm -hmm. I've seen people like gushing over it and saying it's the best superhero movie in in decades or whatever, but I've simultaneously seen a lot of people being like, "Oh, that's it. That's all we got." sort of thing. So, I can't say it's super hard to predict this one. I I think like people who are <laughs> It's so funny. The idea of like the Marvel fan now, it's like the, the most like simplistic blob of humanity that I can imagine. <laughs> but, like the, the the people who are really into what Marvel has become are gonna hate this because it is dark and it is quite somber and it goes to some pretty serious places and it's it's so disconnected from the rest of the MCU. Like there's no real like um attempts to tie this into larger events uh, it's very much just set within its own guardians um universe uh and just telling it it totally miss it, it's completely mismatched anything else that marvel have been putting out in the past several years
point of view that stands against it but i think mm. it's it, it's ironic because i think it's quite a good movie <laughs> Like, at least, like, in Marvel terms, you know, I think it's better than most of what they've put out in the past few years. What would you say its quality is on par with across the MCU? Guardians 2. <laughs> Probably. Oh, that. It's weird. I, weird yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm just, like, what can I compare it? Yeah, it's... it's... To, um... Yeah, like I said, it's like, it's the worst of the three movies. But it's better than anything else they put out since um, since No Way Home, I think. Uh, quality wise, I don't know. Yeah, what would you compare it to, Mauler? So this is tough. Um, I'm try. I'm actually looking through the list of all MCU movies right out of like which one do I think it matches the closest to? Oh. Endgame. Because it's a no. similar. It's wow. a similar tone. Well, I was gonna say it's a similar tonal mess. As in I can, game, I can see how Iron you can Man make three. connections. Oh, Iron Man three, maybe, maybe. The thing is, I I hate Iron Man three probably more than it's bad, um, but it might be able to match up because I could see someone being furious with this film as a hardcore like Guardians fan if they were to pick at very specific things that annoy them. I came out like, oh, God, can I say I was happy? I think so. But like that drained pretty quickly, and now I'm just uh, what what ends up happening, right? Is you start to think about what it could have been, and it's like, holy shit, this could have been way better, way more amazing, and all those mistakes that were made didn't have to happen. And um, I, I, I felt I, I felt emotions in this. Yeah, so did and I. that I'll give it credit for. I felt emotions yeah. for the first time since fucking forever with Marvel. Like so that that's something. And it's probably like... worth. Uh, it's it's worth restating. Clearly, this is more of a film than like basically any Marvel film has been for a while. Yeah, it's it, it absolutely. This is partly why, by the way, the people who say like "Love and Thunder" was my favorite thing since <laughs> Marvel vs. Madness and Quantum Mania is just as good. Yeah. Those people will absolutely lose their minds for this film. They'll be because mm -hmm. they, they'll be experiencing something of an actual story for. For, since ages so they'll think it's the greatest thing ever i've already seen people put it at number one of their overall mcu lists which is just kind of funny to me but yeah. that's fine i saw a ton of content on tiktok with people saying that that this is now their number one mcu movie of all time and that, that's question, like the, that's like when you ask mom. a little kid like what's your favorite movie ever and it's literally so you know it's just like <laughs> such like goldfish mentality <laughs> Why? Um, that's the thing I, it's like you need some people should rewatch the MCU, see how it used to be. It's, it, mm -hmm. it's surprising when you watch an Iron Man, you'll be like, Whoa, yeah. this feels way different. It's like, Yeah, it's been a while, it's been a long time, yeah. unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I don't know what I'm gonna settle on because I haven't, you know, given it the uh fine tooth comb approach that I basically have given all MCU movies, and most of the time. A movie that's left me the way that I'm feeling right now when I give that approach, it's gonna not going to be getting better. I have a feeling I'm going to find more things that I'm not going to like. Um, I, I think I think at least I can say like James Gunn put a bit of heart. I feel like he, he was invested in, in telling a story with this one. Yeah. I just I feel like his focus was a little bit all over the place. I agree. Would be... Should we do some super chats? To round things yeah. out. Okay, let's let's do this. All right. First one here is for JS Pena, who says, "Baggage claim: um, Chimps are apes and not monkeys. You bigot." What is that? What is that a reference to? I think that's a reference to my last video where I made I made like I said we're not all monkeys, and I used a photo of a monkey and a sound of a monkey, but I guess I got it wrong. Sorry. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> For all yeah. the chimp enthusiasts out there, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, Waylon Bacephus says, uh, so tell me, were your people Jacobites or English lovers, drinker? Um, fuck it, I, I can tell you, I can go back like three generations with my family tree and beyond that, it's a complete mystery to me, so I don't know. <laughs> I might be descended from Bonnie Prince Charlie for all I know. Um, and also, would you rather have a deadly case of dyslexia or be stuck in Ryan Johnson's head? <laughs> I, might be, I think I would rather be stuck in his head because it's so enormous that like I feel there'd be a lot of like wiggle room there. So yeah, Is it cheap to say that I don't see much difference in that distinction? <laughs> Possibly not, no. Um 
Mark Scannell says, Critics of Matt Walsh's take on anime don't understand his deadpan sardonic sense of humour and should watch his YouTube video titled Anime is Satanic and That's My Emotional Fact. He all but admits that he says such things in jest. Um, uh, <laughs> if you watch the clip, not very convincing that it's a joke. No. Especially when he's like very sort of like, he's very um, like contemplative about it. He's like, hmm, it's this, it's this, and yeah, you know, it's... Uh, and then I think he finishes out with, like, you know, adults shouldn't be watching cartoons. It's just like, oof. Has, has he kind of gone to war with the quartering recently? <laughs> Apparently they're all going yeah, to fucking did. war over this. I, I the, it was an inevitability. I, I didn't I didn't know if... Because I've known for a long time that those guys all think video games and cartoons are for babies and stuff. And it's just like, that's going to come out eventually because it's a really dumb take. It's like when, uh, when they had uh, Gavin McGuinness on um, Friday yeah. Night Sights. <laughs> Oh, that yeah, was a it, tough one. <laughs> as much as you could, like, you can totally get on with people who have completely different views and stuff, but eventually, Gavin, for example, would just be like, you guys actually play video games. And you're like, yeah. It's, like, yeah, it's, like, in the, it's like, in the same way you watch movies, it's all just entertainment. You know? <laughs> it's, like... it's, it's unbelievable <laughs> that they can't, like, understand. They they just, they, they seriously see it as like, oof, you guys need to grow. Like, we're playing with rattles, and they're like, ooh, look at you yeah. go. <laughs> We actually uh, drink we covered completely disconnected from all this stuff. We just out of curiosity watched Ben Shapiro and Matt Walsh playing video games on EFAB. And I'm not kidding, it came from just like audience suggestions and stuff. And we're just like, yeah, sure. And like he's playing like Five Nights at Freddy's and Matt Walsh, it's like watching someone in hell. He just absolutely <laughs> hates every last second of it. He's like, this is what adult people actually do. And they're like, yeah. And he's like, this is popular. You're like, yeah. And it's just like, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> you either Absolutely. get it or you don't it's like they were born you know it's like their mentality is like they were born 30 or 40 years before they were actually born you know it's like they've just got such an old fashioned view of the world um, yeah. Sir, Cirrhosis of Liver says and I, well, I like that name uh, other than the drinker which is pretty obvious how did everyone come about their username for, exins for instance I drink heavily and I am from Liverpool thanks uh, yeah, so I guess for each of us, how did you get your name? Should I go first? Yeah, we'll go, I guess, clockwise. I've got a Q&A video out there that I think that's the opening question. But um, basically, I think at one point, super long ago, I went by Sith Lord because I just loved Dar uh, uh, Star Wars. Then I was like, that's too generic. And I called myself Darth Maul, thinking that wasn't generic. And then um, I was <laughs> you like, edgy you bastard, you Maul. <laughs> I know, right? Because uh, Darth Maul's the greatest character of all time, god damn it. Uh, so <laughs> then I was in a game with friends, and they all had unique and interesting names. Meanwhile, I had character from Star Wars. And I remember one of them, it was like one of the most insane coincidences sort of things. Is I was in a game with another guy called that. Um, and so I was like, I've got to change his name. And at first I went with Darth Mauler. And then I was like, just drop the Darth. And I was like, there you go, that works. I don't see that anywhere, really. And that's it just stuck. I like the name. Fair play. Uh, Lara, Critical Doggo, how did you get your name? <laughs> Lara. <laughs> ah, she's dead. Okay, Fringy, like what about you? <laughs> yeah. What, what about how, you, Fringy? How did, is, is it Lara Croft? Is that uh, the inspiration? Yeah, named after the character, yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, it's a striking one. Uh, it's just always yeah. been a... Oh, sorry. What was your it, it, uh, it, well, like when you adopt a greyhound? Like they've they've all got their racing names that they had like back in the day, right. and like hers was like uh, Ruby, I think it was, and you know went to adopt her, and it was like, uh, what, what's the deal with changing her name? Like would would she not respond to it? And so the the people at the the sanctuary were like, well, let, we'll test it, and the, so they just went like Ruby, oi Ruby, and she just didn't even look up. So they're like, yeah, you can you can change it to whatever you want. She won't care. <laughs> So that's fine. I, oh, that makes it easier. Yeah. Uh, Fringy's just always been a nickname. Easy. Basically, it. Yeah, not very interesting. Nice. Uh, baggage claim. Yeah, I didn't want to use my real name. I'm just because I live in San Francisco, the most woke city in the world. So I was like, maybe this will impact me socially and people might show up and like <laughs> knock my windows down. So uh, I wanted to pick something and uh, one of my friends suggested baggage claim because I was telling her what I wanted to accomplish with the channel. So I thought that's perfect. That the whole goal would be that you personally choose to claim your emotional baggage and deal with it. And I thought that's perfect. So what that I'm trying to do. That's pretty cool. <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, and platoon. 
I'm genuinely uh, curious about your one. Mine are, mine are almost cringy pretentious. So my first one and my <laughs> second channel name is Lost Chord, um, which I've had since I think started university. And that was the pen name of a poet and the lover of Oscar Wilde, Lord Alfred Douglas, who got him thrown in prison for a bad, well, for a good poem, but a badly taken. The Little Platoon is a phrase of Edmund Burke's, and it describes the sort of civic organizations that people form in their communities on their own back, usually against the government, or at least it's what's allowed to flourish when people don't interfere with you. So like the bird watching society of West Bromwich is an example of a little platoon. What you're doing here is an example of a little platoon. Um, and what I try and do on my channel is also that. So yeah, both incredibly pretentious and I apologize. You Can I just say before, son of a bitch. Before Drinker even <laughs> has to in detail explain how he came to the, the Critical Drinker, because of course that's going to be very interesting and huge lore behind it. But I was just going to say, I love how these answers all <laughs> kind of represent the kind of people we are. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it should be, really. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's just kind of cool, actually. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, well, from from the question there, like, I don't have to give my answer because, like, they said it was pretty obvious. And it is. <laughs> I like drinking. <laughs> I like so, drinking. And you like criticizing. It's perfect. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it seemed like a a, a no brainer, really. Um, just like me. Uh, anyway. Um, Joshua Levesque says, Moller, you guys over at e the EFAP channel, uh, are, are you open to watching and reviewing more Grace videos after her Mario review? Hope so, because Jeez. that one was hilarious. I find it fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I said this before, but a lot of people make claims of it being like a shill or a um, paid grifter, that, that sort of stuff, where she'll just say things because she's got no original thoughts. I think the absolute opposite. I don't think anyone had the balls to say, that Bowser should not be written in a oh. post Me Too era, and that oh. they added a cat suit to appeal to Asian markets. Like I, I was like, fuck it, L. <laughs> like I don't think I've heard these these points from anyone else across the internet. So um, uh, you you've also got like she said, I think that uh, you know Andor was ruined by not having enough Easter egg references to random Star Wars history. It's just like I kind of want. I kind of wanted to stay and to make more videos and to share more of her opinions because she's she's just so gosh darn unique. I mean, she, <laughs> she go definitely girl. is. It's like watching her videos is like sticking your dick in a blender. Like you you could what? do it theoretically. It's just I don't think you should. And it's like I don't think we anything good's going to come out. <laughs> you're you're not going to get any good things coming out of it. Put it that way. And it's just like oh, listening to her, it's so it's hard on the ears. I, I just, yeah, I don't, I don't really, it's like watching Chris Stuckman. I don't really know what you get out of a Grace Randolph review of anything. I, I think Chris Stuckman was useless. I find her to be interesting just because she says things that I don't hear from other people. He's like the complete opposite. He'll only ever say things I've heard from everyone else. I mean, she, she yeah, I mean, I, I guess she has a personality, which probably like ranks her above him. But yeah, there's, there's not much in it in terms of like, useful stuff that I would get out of their videos. Um, Chuxenhausen said, the only bummer with the writer's strike, which I pray will get rid of at least half of these uh, modern audience hacks, is that they actually put an effort into their scripts. And that surprises me, because I would have thought they would have written the scripts already, and so they, they can just film it. They don't need the writers at this point. Unless um... it's like constant revisions or something that they have to do yeah i'm not sure how exactly that whole process would function like without a writer are you allowed to continue the production or is there something in the contracts that prevents it i don't know uh, yeah. in every case anyway um go for broke says uh on efac book book of boba episode two <laughs> at 17 minutes and 42 seconds friggy kind of predicted the giant crocodile in mando season three really <laughs> All right. yeah, I mean, you, I, you said it i mean i don't know <laughs> that, uh, it's 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 kind of incredible at this point with like mando and boba and everything we're at the point of like maybe the sixth or seventh giant monster living in a barren <laughs> wasteland planet yes yep. best uh, is that the they bring back the younglings for training like what are they gonna learn the the channel that i've been watching recently called reaper and he's done a review of all the episodes of mando and he was talking about the crocodile thing and like no wonder it's so pissed off because like when the the, the mandalorians are doing like they're training they're shooting yeah. random rounds into the the like river where it lives 
And it's like, if I was just trying to fucking sleep and someone was setting off explosions <laughs> in my bedroom, I'd be pretty pissed off at them too. It's just, um, it's, it's hilarious yeah, how you had surprise crocodile attack, and then a few episodes later, surprise dragon attack, <laughs> and then the episode ends with the dragon getting eaten by another crocodile. It's like uh, uh... Jurassic World. <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, uh, uh, just for reference, I just checked it. In the episode, you say it feels wrong where you're just walking in the Sahara Desert that suddenly a giant crocodile bears. <laughs> 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 All right, well, there you go. <laughs> you knew. Uh, Stephen Bobo says, Hey, Critical Drinker, you heard that Saudi Arabia banned Final Fantasy 16 because Square Enix refused to censor one of the main characters that's gay. I have no idea about that, but I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they'd banned stuff like that because I know they cracked down on it pretty damn hard. Um, Shan Wick Wickram Singh says, "I didn't know about this uh, I, until I just tried, uh, but apparently you can't buy super chats or super stickers from Sri Lanka yet. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there's something about the internet there that doesn't allow you to do it. No idea. Whenever I come to live in Sri Lanka, I'll test it out and let you know." Um, Bolin Design says the Last Kingdom series hits uh, on all of the classic storytelling and character development while respecting the historical context. I started watching Last Kingdom and I never quite got into it. I find it a bit, a bit meh. I thought it was a bit of a pale ripoff of Vikings, but you know maybe it gets a lot better. I don't know. Also from Shan Wickram Singh says, "What do you think is coming out first, The Winds of Winter or Game of Thrones season eight, episode six, and Unbridled Rage?" Uh, well, who knows? <laughs> like, who could possibly predict? Uh, Don Blackbird says, Have you all seen the Gran Turismo trailer? It looks okay, minimal CGI too. Not since Fast and Furious has the Nissan community felt so represented. <laughs> so that's Steel Blomkamp that's doing that, isn't it? Gran yeah. Turismo. Yeah. What a weird fucking choice of director for something like this. I mean, I hope it's good. I'd like to see him get a hit. So you can the do more movies. The concept is kind of uh, surprising. It seems to be that Gran Turismo is like a game in that world, um, and that's like some competition where people who are good at Gran Turismo end up actually racing. It's like, ah, okay. Yeah, I, I, who knows? We'll see with that one, I guess. Because, yeah, it's kind of a weird game to adapt because there's no characters in the Gran Turismo games. There's no storyline to it. It's literally just a racing game with, with nothing to it. Um so, yeah. Well, they did that with uh there was that Need for Speed movie, right, with uh Aaron Paul. I think that came out like a decade ago. Yeah. And that was like a Need for Sp uh no, a Need for Speed. That was a Fast and Furious kind of like it's kind of be trying to be like that whereas this is more, you know, like racing, like sports racing, like motorsport. Yeah. Uh there's one that's just come in here for followers uh from Jacopo or Ortolani says, Hail Drinker and everyone, do you know about the YouTube channel called The Woke Critic? The guy reviews modern movies while making a caricature, a caricature of someone who agrees with the message. Give it a go if you haven't already, you won't regret it. Uh, yeah, I watched this review on Peter Pan and Wendy and it was fucking brilliant. Uh, the guy's really funny. Um, if you don't subscribe to The Woke Critic, then give him a look because he's really good. He's got a video called How Velma Reinvented Animation. <laughs> <laughs> a new era it's like how occasionally i'll do a sarcastic video this guy just does it all the time it's uh it's never great. breaks it's character really yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah his, his takedowns of velma are, are fantastic um yeah uh next one is andrew mccarty who says cheers mall are curious on how uh, zuko is like kylo Oh well, from back of the day, that's that's years ago now. Basically, the, the summarization is just I just didn't think that they did a good enough job justifying the uh, the character change. But I haven't seen that show now in so long. I wouldn't be able to give you anything more than that. Hmm. Uh, Don Blackbird says, for baggage claim, any thoughts on the failing uh, state of Hollywood, and would you recommend these Brits watch Lagan, the two thousand and one Amir Khan film? Yeah, that's a great film. Um, it's it's. 15 years old I want to say it's longer even maybe potentially even 20 years ago but it's you know it's uh, it's very heartening to an Indian crowd because it's about it's uh, during the British uh, Raj over India and and about um, the Brits 
end up challenging local villagers to a cricket match. And it's, it's, it's a good movie. Hmm. Um, but about the failing state of Hollywood. Yes, I mean, it's, it's abysmal. I think, um, I think Bollywood is doing really well from a movie making perspective. But um, I think it's not, I think the woke infection is going to end up there, I would say, in the next five years and start corrupting that as well. Because you can set, start to see the early trends there as well in how people are starting to talk about things. Really? Like, I, th I would have thought culturally, yeah. India would be so far removed from, like, California. Like, they just would not yeah. accept stuff like that there. Yeah. Uh, but you know that, I I mean, I might be wrong about this, but the trend tends to be, it starts with uh, some of the people that are always on the fringe, right? Like, fashion is always on the fringe. And fashion there, especially with some of these really big brands, are is getting very woke, especially in how they're representing men. They're feminizing men a ton. It's like it's all over the place. And um, I think that's kind of the big indicator. And it's a very na right now, the era there is very nationalistic. I'm not saying that's like negative nationalistic, but it's very nationalistic, like proud. Um, but you always have the the pendulum swing after that, you know, hmm. Um, there's another question from Darren here who says baggage claim. I watched some of your previous recommendations for Indian historical films. I'm sorry if I'm going to butcher these names. Um, Padmavat and Kantara. And I was wondering if you have any others that you would recommend. Cheers. Yeah, Padmavat is the one I was telling you guys about that you would really enjoy it, you and Mahler. Uh, but the rest of you too, I would highly recommend Even it. Even Mahler? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Mahler hates everything. Yeah. I want to hear how much Mahler hates it and so Mahler. <laughs> so, um, but aside from that, historic other historic ones, I think um, just the same director that made Padmavat, he has done incredible historical films. You would not go wrong watching those. Nice. Uh, Mr. Luca says, imagine the James Gunn more sequels, I assume. Maybe. That would have been interesting. James Gunn Star Wars. Yeah. I could have dealt with that. Oh, that was uh, a question I meant to ask before we moved on from Guardians, which is that obviously James Gunn going on to DC, has it made us more or less enthusiastic? Probably less from this movie. Mm -hmm. I, I just feel like James of films that he's good at doing, and when he has to move... Like, how's James Gunn going to do a Superman movie when he hasn't got a team of misfits that he has to, like, throw together to accomplish some, some goal with lots of, like, snarky comedy thrown in? Hey, maybe the challenge will be something that forces something pretty good out of him. Who knows? I mean, he's not he's clearly not a man lacking in talent. I just think he's got, like, a, a thing he's comfortable doing. And, you know, you take him out of that comfort zone, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how he does. Um I'm not discounting the possibility that it could be amazing. I just don't really see it. You know, if we look at his, his filmography, Guardians 2 wasn't that amazing. This has, like, clearly got some pretty big issues. Um, the Suicide Squad, yeah, it was pretty entertaining, but then it wasn't a box office draw, so I don't know what to draw from that one. Um, what was Maker? Uh, next one is um, Demon Dog, who says, Moller and Fringy, I've started watching Simpsons through for the first time. The emotional beats of the early seasons have surprised me compared to most shows currently. As Simpsons experts, when do you recommend stopping? Mm. Hmm. Um, so, I don't, it shouldn't be a hot take, but The Simpsons is still pretty good for a long time after the, uh, I guess what you could call the golden age of that show, like the first, you know, eight or nine seasons. Um, I think by the time I probably fell off was probably like season 21 or 22. That was probably when yeah. I stopped watching like basically like any episode that came out. Um, a vague recommendation, and this doesn't mean that you'll think every episode is great up to that point, but it's a safe place to stop might be the simpson movie um, yeah that's yeah mm. that's a good one yeah and i mean you can watch it it's, i think the simpson movie is solid so you can watch that and then be like goodbye simpsons sort of thing because it does eventually get painful <laughs> yeah 
But then, they, do they not still come out with the occasional banger of an episode? It's just like, you know. Uh, I haven't kept up with it, so I can't really say, but I'd have to imagine there's got to be some stuff in there that's okay. <laughs> Every once in a while, I just see clip shit of like the worst stuff. So it's not yeah. really, I've got a very I biased say, view. Watching a new episode of The Simpsons is kind of surreal. It's uh, it's kind of like a strange, a um, strange experience. Something that really sucks is that they've still got a lot of the same voice actors who were, you know, in their like 40s and 50s when they started. And so <laughs> now you're hearing people who are clearly struggling and it's yeah. sad. Like, yeah, I almost I just wanted to leave him alone. It's the same as like James Earl Jones trying to voice Mufasa. It's like, just, <sighs> just let him let him. Well, let it, him it's least. That. A little bit to and, and bar actually. I think to, to like make the whole main work. cast is still voiced by the same people. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, I know. I, I just mean like they perhaps their voices can't quite get to the pitch that they used to be able to, and so they have mm. to like do a bit of uh, digital assistance. You know, Possibly, to, yeah. to might be the case. Yeah. I heard a clip of uh, Mr. Burns in a newer episode, and I was like, Jesus! I, I so my mistake at first was that they got a new voice actor. It's like no, it's the same one. He's just gone He's very just old. old. It was actually mm. something I noticed in uh, the recent South Park episodes. I I'm not sure. It almost sounded like um. It almost sounded like Matt Stone might have been, or no, it sounded like Trey Parker might have been like ill. Like I'm not, I'm not sure what it was. He he just sounded older, and like it you know it comes through with uh like Stan because that's it's his voice just pitched mm. up, and I noticed it just sounded a little bit off. Yeah, and I think the biggest one that you'll notice anybody who watches like an old episode than a new one is um. Marge is already Marge. like a voice you can meme on, but like <laughs> old, old, old Marge is like, <laughs> <laughs> oh god, she can barely. She should probably just, she should just probably use her like regular voice now. <laughs> it's, it's funny because like the 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 Simpsons once joked about this, like they were talking about why animation was like much better than live action, and like one of the the reasons was like uh, you can you, they don't have to play the the voice actors like anywhere near as much money. And then Flanders walks by and is like has a completely different voice and just goes. Plus, you can replace them, and no nobody can tell the diddly difference. And it yeah. like sounds like a completely different guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know another joke I fucking love from that. It was uh, I think someone they're watching uh, Itchy and Scratchy, and I think Bart because he's into Scouts is like they're using the wrong uh, uh, knot for that. They're supposed to like tie a blah blah blah, not a blah blah blah. And then uh, either Homer or Lisa is like, oh, whatever, it's a cartoon show. They don't care about, like, continuity. And then in the background, Homer is walking, like, past the window while he's sitting <laughs> on the sofa. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> they do still have a sense of humor. Um, J.K. Fozel says, uh, press F in chat for Peter Mayhew Remembrance Day. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's May the 4th. Be with you and all that. Um RRTNZ says, Hail Drinker and Crew, question for all of you. Name a better trilogy uh, ender than Return of the Jedi that isn't Return of the King. Jedi has its flaws, but still a satisfying conclusion. Also, RIP uh, Calculon. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Calculon. Uh, so, yeah, what else ends a trilogy in a really satisfying way? Uh, yeah, I would I'm not gonna... say The Dark Knight Rises. I would like no. No. <laughs> first two movies are so good, but like The Dark Knight Rises is so bad. Uh, How do you feel about Back to the Future? I, I could, I, I'm pretty happy with three. Mm -hmm. I think that ends it pretty nicely. Oh, fuck. The Last Crusade. Yeah, I love that ending. Oh, yeah. Ending. Yeah. Yep. Ending. Because <laughs> as we all know, Last Crusade was the final Indiana Jones movie. It was indeed. <laughs> uh, next question is. Uh, Wayland Bacephus, which does the panel prefer, crack or meth? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, well, well, life's life's true questions. Why choose? Why can't we just yeah. enjoy both? Why not both? Yeah. Angry Batman says, one of my favorite days of the year. Hail to all. Platoon, loving your channel. Mauler, hail to the Elder God. Drinker, may the force be with you. Thank you. Hail. Thank you very much. Uh, Wayland Pacifus says, green alien milk or the accursed Bud Light? <laughs> uh, does the alien milk actually come straight from the, the, the weird sea cow oh. animal? I think I'd probably still drink that over Bud Light because that's like piss water. Do they sell Bud Light here? I don't even know if they do. I, don't... I think they're afraid to come to your territory. 
<laughs> yeah, the, the thing is, right, in, in supermarkets in the UK, you've got like the, the sort of domestic beers and stuff, and then you've got like the American ones that nobody mm. fucking touches. <laughs> it's just like. <laughs> It was kind of I just wouldn't even look at Bud Light or anything. It took yeah. this big a scandal to get Americans to stop drinking a shit beer. You shouldn't be drinking that anyway. <laughs> I love that. There, there's plenty of other <laughs> shit beers that they can drink, though. They've got, like, Coors and, and yeah, you know... What's the other one? Yeah, yeah we have ton, tons of options on bad beer here, for sure. Yeah. It's just funny, right? It's like, I'm not going to drink it anymore because of that controversy. And then you're just like... Why were you drinking that? What the fuck's wrong with you? Drink, yeah. the... drink, at, drink some good um, stuff. At a baseball game at Fenway Park in New York, someone took video showing that the line for Bud Light was just non-existent. Damn. People are like outright, yeah, rejecting that beer. Well, yeah, isn't it? Like, you know, there's like shell stores and stuff because <laughs> just nobody's interested. Yeah, um, it's not selling anywhere. Yep. I mean, they messed with the wrong demographic. Like, there are very specific types of people that drink Bud Light, they're, and they're not interested I, in this nonsense. It's like, yeah, I know your audience. Like, if I had to guess, you know, the, the kind of guys who are going to drink cheap beer in the States are going to be, like, working-class men. Yeah. And like, yeah. they are probably not going to be huge fans of Dylan Mulvaney's. And <laughs> maybe, maybe don't get your, your vice president of marketing saying, yeah, the problem with our brand is it seemed to be too fratty. Because who are you Who are you criticizing when you say that? It's probably your core audience, um, which yeah. is not a good idea. But it is weird that the, the way people react en masse like that. So like, I remember like day one of lockdown when everyone was panic buying booze and all you could find left on the shelves was Corona. So you're not going to catch it from that. But... If we're going to do that, then can we name the next one Johnny Walker, please? <laughs> they, hey, the, there's a, a really overpriced uh, Johnny Walker experience that you can go on in, in Edinburgh, and it's like a, a distillery tour. And I just think, why would you do that for such a shit whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Oh, Johnny Walker Black is good. Breakfast is good. It's all blended, though, isn't it? Yeah. So you can get it everywhere. Of, well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is, this is from a guy who drinks Jack Daniels on occasion, so yeah, I can't <laughs> criticize. Um, Northern English Bastard says, off to do a stag do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, no. Wife and who are to be married in June. Well, good luck to both of you. Good luck, yes, Dale Best of luck Annette. to whatever it yeah. was that you said there. <laughs> you definitely uh, did... did not cut out at the crucial point. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll read this one again because it deserves it. Um, he says, off to a stag do this weekend. Please give a shout out to my Dale Taylor and his future wife, Annette, who are to be married in June. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Have, a, Congratulations. have a great wedding and a great marriage. Yes. I hope it's lovely for you. Yeah, um, and I hope you can have your cake and eat it too. Yay. Buy two cakes. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Just, just don't serve Bud Light at the wedding. Um, yeah. Mike, Michael Jackson's pharmacist says, Google, what space movie came out in 1992? What? <laughs> um, um, should we try the, it? Wait, is Maul we're doing it? Well, what? Uh, 1992 space. Oh, wait, I know this. I already know what the answer because it? it's been done before. A movie I'm not allowed to read out. <laughs> <laughs> can you, can you uh, give oh. us a hint? Yes, I can. Uh, there, there is a particular uh, group of people from outer space. <laughs> okay. I, I am familiar with this film. Can, yeah, can, you, you, can you put it in it. private chat for me, for my benefit? Yeah. You guys can type <laughs> 1992 space I, I movie can't, for Google. Yeah, but you have to factor in the fact I can't be bothered, because I would have to open up a new tab, <laughs> oh, and that's well, too you much know effort. What? I'm, I'm, I'm your sponsor. I'm like, no, you gotta, you got to get past this hump in oh. your life where you can't type things. Okay. Yeah, see? <laughs> See, it's not okay. weird. <laughs> okay. uh, all right. Yeah. Moving we don't need onward. To put in trouble. Nice let's, try. let's go. Let's go <laughs> onwards and upwards. Uh, Drive-by commenter says: Now with the Directors Guild hanging back and letting the WGA go first in striking, it confirms how fast this AI takeover in media is moving. Yeah, it's like we said earlier. It's only a matter of time. Um, James Robertson says: Forget Michael Keaton's Batman. We want CGI Adam West Batman. That I Maybe would go to see. It. Beating the shit out of Ezra Miller. That would be fantastic. Ooh. Uh, Dick Squad says, Have you all seen Severance? It's an amazing show and I think you would all love it. Characters and the plot is amazing. I would say it's on the level of Breaking Bad Season 1 and Westworld Season 1. 
well, I wasn't a huge fan of Westworld season one, so. Oh, there's yeah, always one. That's isn't how there? spicy the takes can get. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a lot of recommendations for Severance, though. I've uh, heard a lot of recommendations for that and Succession. Succession, mm. I've heard a lot of. Yeah. Everyone rants about mm -hmm. Succession. I can't yeah. stand it. I cannot stand it. I tried. I watched five episodes. It's an abomination. It's like every other like every other word is a curse word, and that drives me crazy. How much oh. the word "fuck" is just in everything now. It actually really that. pisses me off. <laughs> it pisses me off. I feel like I I miss the days where people actually wrote, you know, with it, with the desire to like show their love for the English language. It's like now it's like no, let's just replace every word with "fuck." I, I will say uh, when we were talking about. Guardians of the Galaxy earlier. Um, they have one fuck in the movie, and it does mm -hmm. land pretty well. I will, g yeah, I I will like give that it one. that. <laughs> <laughs> like it was it. pretty good. <laughs> Pratt's delivery was really good with it as well. Um, next one is Ghost of Aces, who says, Today is my birthday, and May the 4th be with you doesn't quite bring a smile to my face like it used to before Disney wokeified it. I am sorry that Disney ruined Star Wars. I would like to apologize on their behalf, because they never <laughs> will. Uh, the Gird King says, Hail Mauler, uh, Pan, and Drinker Bell. There we go. Thank you. All right. Uh, John Bisgies says, Please pet the critical doggo for us. <sighs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good man. Good man. Aww. <laughs> She's just napping away. There. Job done. She didn't move much. Uh, next one is AJ Matheson, who says, Hail Drinker and the rest of the bar. I know you guys are fans of Korean films and TV, and I want to suggest The Tiger, an old hunter's tale. It stars the lead from Old Boy as an old broken hunter. Uh, and mm. continues, uh, what is it, AJ Matheson? Uh, during the Japanese occupation, uh, raising his teenage boy and the consequences of his former hunting team inciting... Uh, the anger of a near mythic level tiger. Blood, gore, revenge, grief, big battles, and a heroic last stand. I mean, it sounds pretty fucking good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like that idea. Uh, Mist Eidolon says, is Critical Drinker on strike? He's making movie and he's a writer. So, uh, Mauler, <laughs> I assume he's a Welsh working man. Kisses to everyone. You are a Welsh working man, aren't you, Mole? We're on YouTube writing strike. No more videos until yeah. <laughs> we get our pay or something. No more scripts. We can't fucking we don't... strike on YouTube. <laughs> we, we don't have a union either, so there's not no. much we can do, really. It's if about you time. Us tomorrow, that'll be it. Yeah. Uh, Chota says Resident Evil 4 remake review? Review? I mean, I review? could review it. I could indeed, yeah. Um, give me an extra, like, uh, I don't know, a week or so to write the script and get all the footage I need and stuff and then do it. But yeah, mm -hmm. I will get around to it. Uh, Kevin O'Neill says, Drinker and panel, have you ever had a bad drinking night that turned you off from a particular spirit? Southern comfort. <laughs> it is shit. Okay. I always bounce okay. back. No matter how the bad an experience I have with a spirit, I will eventually get back around to it. Um, I had some bad nights with Sambuca. I'll tell you that much. And I'm not a fan of like aniseed flavoring, so yeah, that, that stuff just never goes down well with me. I once um, had a drinking competition with vodka with Polish people at a Brazilian lesbian wedding party and ended up in a bath. And then with people making out on top of me, which is really interesting. Um, and I didn't have vodka again for probably six months, but that's about as long as it's been. <laughs> probably the most I ever threw up was from vodka, actually. Um, the early days of my drinking career, and it did, it just did not sit well with me at all. And, well, up it came. And it just never stopped for the whole night. I was out of action. Um, yeah, I remember one night I was out in Dundee, um, and one of my friends decided we should do a round of um, sake, shots of sake. Ooh. And uh, we did it, and it, I was like, that's the, that's kind of disgusting. I didn't really enjoy that. And he just went green around the gills and ran away <laughs> and didn't come back for about 20 minutes. And we eventually decided we should go and check on him. And so we went down to the, the toilets of this place. And he, <laughs> there was just like vomit marks down the walls. Like oh, he'd, no. he'd oh the, the projectile vomited on the way to the bathroom. And he was just 
out of commission for the next hour or so. It was I've never seen anything like it. Um, the worst tasting yeah. one ever was Ray and Nephew's Superproof 80% White Rum, which gave one of my friends a heart, a heart attack, heart palpitations, panic Jeez. attack, because oh. it's incredibly strong. And we were doing shot roulette, and that, that was the killer one. And she had it, and she did not have a fun evening. But we did. And it was great fun. Anything over like 45, 50% is just, it's not pleasant to drink. <laughs> There's just no way to get it down yet. It just it repeats it's on you. Fuel. And, yeah, it, it does. It's like I can feel it like vaporizing my heart as I try to drink it. It's just, it's not <laughs> yeah. fun. It's not nice. Yeah. I think my first ever like hard liquor drink was Southern Comfort and it was 100 proof. And that was not a good place to start. <laughs> That's not a good. Yeah. yeah, you jumped in at the deep end with that one, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I should have started uh, with the light beer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lucas Everett says, uh, good day, drinker and mauler. Uh, at work now, but we'll have some good cherry vodka watching this when I get home. Um, good day. Yeah, good day to you, sir. Um, <laughs> what's the next one? Um, thoughts on American graffiti? Not I seen don't it. I don't, don't really have any thoughts on it, unfortunately. Yeah, sorry, man. Um, yeah, I haven't seen it either. I'll do a couple more and then we will finish up. Uh, Monksman of 117B says, watch Unicorn War, Spanish animated movie inspired by Bambi, Apocalypse Now, and the Bible. <laughs> I've seen this talked That's about before. Yeah. <laughs> <What the f> <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to mash up three random things together. Uh, Teddy bears wage a genocidal holy war against unicorns, apparently. Yeah, okay. No, actually, cool. yeah, okay, I want sure. to see that now. Uh, yeah, fuck those unicorns, by the way. They're all uppity. I think they're so special. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine to... It's just a horse with a horn, you know? Big deal. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's like... Special. Uh, Aberos Muchos says, Is Lara a greyhound? Yes, she is. Hence the fact that she's unconscious for about 90% of her life. <laughs> uh, they just, <laughs> they just ah, the don't want to move. To live. <laughs> uh, Tom Abella says... What non-culture movie uh, YouTube channel host would you most like to talk or collaborate or geek out with? Start with Lara. She ain't got nothing to say. She's just uh, into Greyhounds, that's all. Um, yeah, any any people we would like to do some kind of live stream with? That's that non... Not... Yeah, so it's, what is it? Non-culture um, or movies? Non-culture? Isn't like everybody technically discussing culture in some way? Okay. I mean, I guess maybe culture war or something. Um, hmm. I I want to do a stream with Steve MRE. I just want to get a bunch of MREs and eat them with him. <laughs> it's just, it feels like it'd be the most chilled stream ever. <laughs> Does like would like Wings of Redemption count, or is he culture? I mean, um, he, I don't associate culture with Wings of Redemption, to be fair. <laughs> he he has is culture. culture. When mean? I think of culture, I think of art galleries and stuff, and it's like, that's that's not him. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I just have to think about, uh, of all the people I watch and are interested in, which ones wouldn't count as like cultural critics or commentators, I suppose. Clue me yeah, in as well, right? Is, is Wings fighting uh, yes. Boogie? Yes, he is. It's happening in three weeks, I think. So, yeah. two morbidly obese forty-year-old men are going to fight each other in a boxing ring. The, I believe the description of it is eight hundred pounds, one ring. <laughs> <laughs> wow! It's going to be over in about thirty seconds. Well, I'll be watching. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> Best thirty seconds of your life. Yeah. Did you think a, a boxing special EFAP on that? Is bringing if some we're allowed to restream it, I would happily make a mini out of it. That'd be funny. <laughs> you need to get like a proper boxing expert in just to like really drill down into the techniques on display because <laughs> I'm sure there's going to be some. Well, okay. Um, I guess they've got to make their money some way, I suppose. Um, Garrett Hayden says, Thank you for answering my super chat last week. I hope that you get the first chapter ready for presentation for all the lads in the coming year. Uh, or I hope to get the first chapter ready. So uh, I'm guessing he's writing a book or something? Oh, well, best of luck to you, man. Um, Frank with the C says, When I saw the Peter, Peter Pan and Wendy trailer, all I could think of was, God, I miss Robin Williams. Also, EFAP movies on Hook when? 
Uh, well, we do kind of want to do all of the Disney classics and then remakes. It gives us an excuse to check out the classics and then to sort of talk about the just utter failure to translate, you know, these things through time, um, which, you know, each one has unique problems and stuff. So maybe we'll get there one day. Who knows? Obviously, by the time this one has died in terms of cultural discussion, The Little Mermaid is right around the corner as well. So and then Lila would stitch. I don't know. That's going to be painful, too. Mm. Uh, yeah. Um, Hikira says, Fringy! I haven't seen him since episode 7 about No Way Home. That is my personal favourite open bar. Wow. It's yeah. been a while. I that think was... I was on a couple after that. Cause, uh, you, yeah, you've been on a few Prey. times. Yeah, Prey, I remember that. And I remember discussion about Matrix res what was the new one? Resurrection. Resurrection. Yeah, which yeah. I haven't seen, but that was interesting. <laughs> Uh, no, it's always good to have you on. Um, yeah. And last of all, with CJ Noll, he says, we got English, Scottish, Welsh, American, and Australian presentation. All the Anglo nations that matter. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Someone the, somewhere in New Zealand. The Western Front right here. <laughs> New Zealand's not a country. It's just like Wales. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I know we've been streaming for for a good three hours or so, um, so I'll probably finish it up there. But uh, I want to say thank you to to all my guests tonight. Uh, it's been fantastic to have you guys on. Um, Fringy, great to have you back. Baggage Claim, awesome to have you back on the channel again. Um, and Little Platoon, you're practically a regular on this. So uh, as always, great to have you back as well. The more the better. Thank you for having me. Um, like obviously the links to everyone's channels are in the description the critical doggo doesn't have her own channel yet but we'll get that sorted um, but if you haven't subscribed to all three of these lovely guests already then please do consider doing it because they all produce fantastic content um, and I guess is there anything that you guys are want to make us aware of anything you got coming up that uh, you'd like to tell the audience about Who All right. First, I'll take that as a no then. then uh, awesome. No, no. I'll, I'll, um, I'm. I think uh, next I'll try to have a video talking about uh, Peter Pan. Hopefully, it's not just stuff I've already said. Hopefully, I can come up with some more stuff. But I want to have a video about that. And then at the end of the month, I'm gonna dive more deeply into the woke movement and try to analyze that on a high level. Nice. And hopefully, emerge um, sane afterwards. This is always the challenge when you dive deeply into the woke realm. Um, yeah, I've, I've also got go Peter crazy. Pan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go native, in other words. Um, I, yeah, I've also got um, Peter <laughs> Pan. Attempt number six at getting this past copyright. So hopefully it'll be out tomorrow. And then Monday, maybe a Guardians video. And then I do a live show, which is sort of tentatively and modestly called the best show in the universe, probably. Um, and that will be at 10, my time, 5 Eastern. And all of you guys are welcome. If you're free, if you want to drop in for a bit, we'd love to have you on. So that will be Monday. I believe, uh, well, I think I'm joining you for that one. So, um, yeah, should be good. Yeah. Um, um I'm just, uh, presently working on the finale for EFAP TV Mandalorian season three. That's what I'm working on right now. And hopefully that'll be done soon. Yeah. Mm. And then Saturday we're doing a extensive breakdown of guardians three. So if you mm -hmm. want to know more and that'll be full spoilers. That'll yeah, because we, we've kept it light here, and I think we should feel proud of ourselves, actually, because we didn't really spoil anything major on this one. I think and that's so, pretty yeah. rare on Open Bar, because we're pretty slapdash about this kind of thing normally. <laughs> um, but yeah, well, thank you everyone for joining us for this one. Thank you for the all, all the awesome Super Chats, like incredibly generous as always, and if we've missed any, we'll get through them um, on our a, on a catch-up stream as we always do. And thank you to our lovely mods who've done their usual sterling work. Very much appreciated. Uh, but for now, that's all we've got for today. So go away now. Bye. Bye.